The private sector has a fundamental and underappreciated impact on the resilience of democracy, both in their home countries and around the world. Through business practices, corporate leadership, and stakeholder engagement, companies can help shape civic discourse, reinforce the rule of law, and ensure that democracy delivers for their employees, customers, and communities. What happens at work often extends into society. Civic education facilitates civic participation. Worker organizing lays the groundwork for social movements. And fair and equitable opportunities at work build healthier and more engaged communities. Company voices are also powerful influencers. When corporate leaders speak up for rule of law, free and fair elections, freedom of the press, and the safety of human rights defenders, governments and societies listen. When they don't, that silence can be deafening. The evidence is clear. Democracy is good for business. Now is the time to ensure that business is good for democracy. Good morning. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the 2023 Forum on Business and Democracy. I'm Marty Flax, Kosravi Chair in Principled Internationalism and Director of the Human Rights Initiative, and I'm going to serve as your MC this morning. We're here today because of the centrally important role the private sector plays in the strength and sustainability of democracy in the countries where they're based, where they operate, and where they source from. In 2021 and 22, my employer overtook government, civil society, and the media as the most trusted source of information for citizen, uh, citizens across 27 countries surveyed by the Edelman Trust Barometer. This is a solemn responsibility. And what happens at work permeates across society, from promoting health, safety, and equity in the workplace, to modeling support for rule of law, transparency, and accountability. This forum is intended to build on the State Department's February 3rd call to the private sector to advance democracy. And we welcome the commitments that have been made by companies in response to that call, which you'll find in a State Department fact sheet being issued this week. I want to thank the Ford Foundation and the Open Society Foundations for making today's event possible. And I want to thank all of you in the room and online who have taken the time to make it a priority to participate in this conversation in the context of the Second Summit for Democracy, as I believe strongly that efforts to address democratic backsliding and make democracy more resilient will not succeed unless all stakeholders are engaged. Our, ad our agenda for this morning is straightforward. We'll start with an opening session featuring remarks from Im two important leaders in this space. We'll then have two morning discussions followed by a short break our third and final panel, and concluding remarks. We hope all of you watching are engaged in this conversation. For those in the room, there will be a QR code posted on the screens around you so you can submit questions to our panelists. And for those watching online, please use the question box on the CSIS homepage. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our CEO and President of the Center for Strategic and International Studies and our Langone Chair in American Leadership, Dr. John Hamry, who's going to kick off our program and welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Hamry. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Gosh, it's great to have you here. I just... I love seeing people back in our building, you know, I'm, I'm kind of tired of the Hollywood Squares thing and, and to be able to actually have real people in a real meeting, it's really great. And, and of course, you know, the cherry blossoms have just, it just, it makes Washington worth living in at least part of the year, you know, <laughs> it's just lovely, it's just great. I, I, uh, I, my, my role is ornamental today, uh, so I'm not going to, to take too much of your time. I, I, I do want to just say a word of how important this topic is. You know, I, if you think about it, at the core of democracy, it's about rule of law. It's that the weak and the poor have as much right in front of, the, of, of justice as do the rich and the poor, uh, rich and the strong. And the government is subject to rule of law, not just the governed. It's, it's the foundation for this glorious democracy that we have been born into. 
Um, it's still, uh, you know, a, not a perfect union, and we're working on that all the time. Um, but it is, it's a precious thing, and we have inherited it, and we got to keep it going, okay? Now, if you, if you think about it, uh, no one is more committed to and dependent on quality governance and rule of law than the business world. It's the foundation of predictability in the business world. And, and so the, democracy is obviously a great, great benefit to business. And business can be the great champion of democracy. I think it is. I, it carries the flag of our values around the world. It's the gold standard. And so it's really important to have this conference. And I'm, I'm really glad to see so many of you here. We are extremely fortunate to have the Deputy Secretary with us. And I have a, a bias. Okay, I was a deputy secretary of defense, and I, we always prefer deputy secretaries here at CSIS <laughs> because they really run it, you know. Um, but I, honestly, Don is, he's doing a phenomenal job. He's opening up the aperture of the Commerce Department. You know, he's bringing a focus to, you know, the old days it used to be the, the big powerful companies that could afford big lobbying shops that were strong in commerce. He's opening up that aperture to other voices that in the past haven't had that opportunity. Profit-seeking and not profit seeking companies because it grows out of his, his personal background. He brings the richness of modern American experience to this leadership role. And we're very fortunate that he's with us today. He's going to open up this conference and get us kind of on the trajectory together for what's going to be a very good day. So could I ask you with your enthusiastic applause, welcome Don Graves, Deputy Secretary of Commerce, please. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, John, I, or should I say Mr. Deputy Secretary. Um, it's really uh, wonderful to be here uh, back at, uh, at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you for hosting this forum. Um, I also want to thank the private sector leaders that are here in the room today. It's really important that this be about how government, the private sector, work together to, f to further democracy. You play an absolutely vital role in preventing democratic, preventing and countering democratic backsliding around the world and ensuring that, demo that democracies deliver for their people. As President Biden has said, democracy doesn't happen by accident. Democracy needs a champion. And for my conversations with the private sector and from the commitments and successes that we're gonna hear about in this forum, I know that businesses, large and small, are standing up and being counted. And there's a good reason for that. Throughout our history, especially since the end of World War II, we've recognized that the foundations of a prosperous, inclusive, and stable world economic order are democratic societies that value the rule of law, as John said, fundamental freedoms, human and labor rights, fair and mutually beneficial trade, and innovation and entrepreneurship. We know from our history here in the U.S. that when we've adhered to the highest ideals, our private sector has absolutely flourished, creating unprecedented economic opportunities for the middle class and for those that are seeking to join the middle class. Put simply, democracy creates conditions for private sector growth, and a flourishing private sector, in turn, ensures that, that democracy delivers. Yet today, we are at a pretty critical moment in time, whether it's China's misuse of critical technologies or Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Authoritarian regimes across the world are ever more adversarial. They're taking actions that serve to undermine the rules-based economic order that we as democracies have been building for decades. And we're at a critical juncture on how we in the government and the private sector in democratic societies Re, uh, respond, it'll have a profound impact on the future. We'll work together to secure the benefits of democracy, not only for this generation, but for future generations. And that's the challenge that we're here to discuss today. It's why the Biden and Harris administration, uh, the, the call to action that, that uh, the president and the vice president made to the private sector 
and in this forum on business and, de and democracy are so timely. So this morning I'd like to discuss why the role of business in, advocate, in advancing democracy is so important and what the Commerce Department is doing with U.S. business in partnership in four critical areas. First, winning the high stakes competition with authoritarian adversaries. Second, advancing the global fight against corruption. Third, promoting labor and environmental standards and human rights in the conduct of business. And fourth, prote protecting the civ civic space. So let me go back to that first point on the high stakes, high stakes tech competition with authoritarian adversaries. Authoritarian regimes are accelerating their efforts to appropriate critical technologies. We've seen this around the world, including for military modernization, for mass surveillance, and other human rights abuses. Their efforts to control supply chains, including clean energy supply chains and others, can create choke points that will jeopardize the ability of our democracies to deploy vital technologies to further their development. Look no further than China which, for example, is using supercomputing capabilities and AI models to monitor, track, and surveil their own citizens. And as been widely reported, they're also harnessing biotech to build a massive DNA database to help fuel their surveillance state and repress members of ethnic and religious minority groups. This technological advantage, along with economic coercion, means that they can undermine the sovereignty of other countries, including their ability to develop freely. We've seen this in countries from Eastern Europe to the Pacific. How this global tech competition plays out will profoundly shape our economic security, our ability to innovate, to grow exports, create jobs of the future, and to provide opportunities to all of our people. It'll also impact our national security. It's vital that free and democratic societies prevail if the future world order is to be based on norms like free flow of information, data privacy, and an open internet rather than the alternative, democratic backsliding, the subversion of markets by state actors, and fewer opportunities for private sector innovation. That's why the Commerce Department is taking action on three fronts, along with our like-minded allies and partners, to ensure that the private sectors help democracies to deliver. Under the Biden administration, we've broken new ground in our partnership on export controls to prevent misuse of technologies, including where it exacerbates democratic backsliding, as well as in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. For instance, at the 2021 Summit for Democracy, the administration announced the creation of export controls and human rights initiative collaboration with Australia, Denmark, Norway, and others. And through that initiative, we're working to stem the misuse of technology and to promote a positive vision for technologies anchored by democratic values. Similarly, last October, we took strong action to restrict access to AI-enabling technologies, such as advanced semiconductor manufacturing equipment and other items to China. We've also vigorously used the entity list, as I'm sure many of you have seen, and other restrictions to prevent both foreign government and private sector entities from accessing commercial technologies that can be employed to abuse human rights. Private sector compliance ensures that these controls are successful. We're also working to win the tech competition through the development of risk frameworks that help the private sector anticipate and mitigate emerging threats in key technologies. As John said, predictability. It's all about predictability, consistency, and transparency. Earlier this year, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, or NIST at, uh, at Commerce, released its AI risk management framework, which is a voluntary, voluntary framework to advance more trustworthy and responsible development and use of AI while managing risks based on our democratic values. AI has been all over the news. We've all seen it uh, over the last few weeks. The framework helps to accelerate AI innovation and growth while protecting against misuse, against civil rights, civil liberties, and equity. We also released via the White House, a vision for harnessing biotechnology and biomanufacturing R&D to build supply chain resilience, which includes ensuring that we consider biosafety and biosecurity risks from the start of development and use of the technologies. Finally, we're also investing to preserve our tech advantage through industrial strategies at home that mobilize private sector investment, growth, and jobs in critical technologies that'll have an outsized impact on our economic future. 
Thanks to the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, we're investing billions in our domestic semiconductor industry. Under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, we're deploying nearly $50 billion to bring affordable, reliable, high-speed internet to every American, every family, every household, every street, every business in the country. Under the Inflation Reduction Act, the administration is making the largest ever federal investment in clean energy innovation. At the same time, we're bolstering our investment screening capabilities through, for instance, our review of inbound investments in U.S. companies and operations under the Committee for, uh, on Foreign Investment in the United States, or CFIUS, to identify adversarial capital that leaves us vulnerable. We're working closely with the private sector to alert companies to the potential risks of transactions with malign actors, and we're considering outbound investment screening in areas where we may inadvertently further adversaries' efforts to undermine our economic and national security interests. We're doing the same things abroad. We're revitalizing economic alliances with partners and democracies around the world in Europe, the Indo-Pacific, Africa, and Latin America. Through bilateral engagements in countries as diverse as Mexico, Cote d'Ivoire, and India, as well as multilateral, multilateral approaches like the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, or IPEF, commerce's leading efforts to improve market conditions for exporters, ensuring acceptance of high uh, product and labor standards, improving supply chain resiliency, and driving progress on the clean energy transition and digital trade. We're building on President Biden's announcement of $15 billion in private sector deals at the U.S. Africa Business Forum in December, and Vice, President's Harris, uh, Vice President Harris's announcements just this week in Africa. These deals are cementing business-to-business -business relationships across the Atlantic in ways that promote jobs and demonstrate how democracies working together can deliver for our citizens. Business is also an indispensable ally in the fight against corruption, the secondary I mentioned earlier. President Biden has called corruption a cancer within the body of societies, and this administration has released the first ever U.S. strategy on countering corruption. You all know this, corruption corrode, erodes trust in business and democratic institutions. It undermines economic growth, social equity, and democracy, and corruption, importantly, distorts markets and prioritizes private gain over public interests. Under that strategy, we're working with governmental and non-governmental partners, including bolstering, bolstering and promoting private public partnerships to more consistently bring in the private sector as critical actors in the fight against corruption, to help level the playing field for businesses operating with integrity, and to improve the international business climate. The Commerce Department supports a wide range of efforts of work with the business community to combat corruption. In Africa, for example, through our commercial law development program, we're working with the Nigerian Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission to develop and implement ethics and transparency standards. Here in the Americas, we partnered with the private sector to establish the Inter-American Coalition for Business Ethics for the MedTech sector. This is a code of ethics for the Western Hemisphere in a sector of export value for U.S. companies, and it's supported by ethics compliance training and a monitoring mechanism to track progress. And under the fair economy pillar of IPEF, we're working with 13 partner countries across the Indo-Pacific to accelerate progress on implementation of international obligations such as the UN Convention Against Corruption to promote private sector ethics and compliance programs and facilitate input from the private sector, including business organizations, industry associations, workers' organizations, on progress of implementation of anti-corruption efforts. The third area I mentioned was advancing labor and environmental standards and human rights. The private sector has a choice in how they conduct their business, how they innovate and produce, how they source inputs. A work-centric, climate-smart approach, and one that respects human rights reflects foresight and is more likely to contribute to shared prosperity, to reduce inequality and sustainability. From my conversations with CEOs and small business owners across the United States, I know that many business leaders understand this. That's why we collaborated with the private sector and the Department of Labor to publish a set of principles for what constitutes good jobs. In the industrial strategy programs that we're implementing right now, we're also asking companies to submit workforce development plans that align with these good jobs principles. 
We're encouraging project labor agreements, which are an essential tool in ensuring that construction projects of this scale and, and complexity are able to stay on track. And because child care is critical to expanding employment opportunities and in uh, meeting the workforce needs in a challenging lab labor market, we're requiring companies that receive CHIPS funding to tell us how they plan to pro provide access to affordable child care for workers. We're following a similar approach abroad because we know that we can't do things here without also uh, holding other countries to the same standards. So we're doing this with partner countries. For instance, the Partnership for Global Infra Invest Investment in Infrastructure, or PGII, G7 partnership, aims to leverage a total of $600 billion in public and mostly private infrastructure financing in emerging markets for projects in health security, clean energy uh, transition, critical minerals, and the digital economy. These PGII projects aim to be inclusive, transparent, and supportive of high labor and environmental standards that enhance their sustainability and impact. Over the course of 12 roundtables with the private sector over the past year, the Commerce Depart Department has heard time and again how U.S. businesses view these high standard projects as a key differentiator related, relative to our competitors. Our partners, this is not us, our partners in emerging markets in turn view the U.S. private sector as the partner of choice. We hear this over and over and over again. So working together in this way, businesses with governments at home and abroad are ensuring that democracies deliver. And there's more. The private sector is also a key ally on the front lines of the fight for democracy. Following Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, I was particularly proud to see the U.S. business community step up through the donation of funds and critical products in kind support to help the continued flow of commerce and, in, uh, and industry expertise and know-how to assist Ukraine in other ways. This matters on a daily basis. Finally, the private sector in democratic, democratic societies has a vital responsibility in protecting the civic space. A healthy public square encourages debate, ensures access to information, and provides the enabling environment for free speech. And here, too, the private sector's role and its voice as a key stakeholder in civic society is critical. That's why, on behalf of the United States, I was pleased to sign, uh, sign on to the Declaration for the Future of the Internet. The Declaration is a political commitment led by the U.S., the European Commission, Australia, Canada, Japan, and the U.K. to defend the open Internet, to promote human rights online, and foster fair competition in the digital economy. We're working with multiple stakeholders, including the private sector, to implement and advance the principles laid out in the Declaration. From where I sit in the Commerce Department, I see the vital importance of the private sector's voice along with labor and other stakeholders in rulemaking and policy form formation every single day. We currently at the Department of Commerce support 62 federal advisory communities across a w wide array of topics. These committees are vital vehicles for transparent private sector engagement that by design bring diverse voices to develop consensus recommendations on policy priorities. Membership is public, as are the committee meetings and the recommendations. You may say, great, you have a lot of meetings. But these meetings are open, they're public, they're transparent. We're getting input from a wide array of stakeholders. That's not something that every country adheres to. And it's important that we take those values out around the world and spread them. So I'm going to close with this, because I've spoken longer than I probably should have. A prosperous business community and a flourishing democracy are inextricably tied. But democracy, like business, is always a work in progress, as, as John uh, said just a little while ago. It takes leadership, vision, and commitment to keep a business running, just as it takes those same qualities to advance the values of democracy around the world. The conditions for a free and open democracy enable businesses to thrive, Companies, therefore, have an incentive and a vital role to advance democratic norms, principles, and institutions. This forum is helping to deepen the vital partnerships among government, the private sector, and other stakeholders as we work to strengthen democracy around the world. We in the government are working hard to set that stage, but we can't do it alone, and we shouldn't do it alone. The actions of the business community are paramount to this effort. We need you 
to be champions of democracy. That's why this forum is so important. We're counting on you to continue your critical work to, uh, to counter author authoritarianism and democratic backsliding, to combat corruption, to promote human rights, and I know that you are up to the task, and we are absolutely eager to work with you. So on behalf of the entire administration, I want to thank CIS for this opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you for hosting the forum. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you today, and I look forward to continuing our partnership together. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Deputy Secretary Graves, for really inspiring remarks and for helping to frame the rest of today's conversation. We're now going to hear via video from uh, Microsoft President Brad Smith. As Microsoft's Vice Chair and President, Mr. Smith plays a key role in spearheading the company's work on critical issues involving the intersection of technology and society, including cybersecurity, privacy, artificial intelligence, environmental sustainability, human rights, immigration, and philanthropy. And as a result, there is no one better place to speak to today's topic and the importance of the business role in democracy than Brad Smith. Hello, everyone. I'm Brad Smith, the Vice Chair and President at Microsoft, and I'm really honored to be a part of the Summit for Democracy. When we look at the world today, one of the things that is so clear is the role that technology is playing in every country around the world, especially in the world's democracies. As I look from my particular vantage point, I often think about the fact that digital technology has really become part of the fundamental infrastructure for democratic societies. It's fundamental to every customer we serve, to communities, and even countries. And that has huge implications for this summit, for all of us, and certainly for how we think about technology. I think in the first instance, it calls on us to ensure that technology is available to everyone, to bring broadband to everyone around the planet, and to do so with the recognition that, frankly, we still have 750 million people that don't yet have access to electricity, the greatest invention of the 19th century. So we're very focused on bringing technology and skills so that people can use this as tools to improve their own lives. But in a sense, that defines where many of the great questions for the world's democracies begin, not where they end. I think it calls on us to think about how we ensure that technology serves democracy well. And I have no problem saying that I think it is not just right, but proper for businesses not only to speak up, but to stand up for the defense of democracy. Because I think businesses flourish when democracies flourish, when creativity flourishes, when freedom gives us the ability to innovate and work together. And that has many ramifications for us as a company and industry, and for all of you, all of us, as we're talking about the issues at this summit. I think for every business, we have to think about what we're doing for our employees. It's why Microsoft was an early signatory for the Civics at Work Pledge, a pledge really created in advance by CSIS in Washington, D.C. itself. What that means for us is at Microsoft, we work to ensure that our employees have access to information, that it's easy for them to vote, that we create a hub that shows them how they can participate, that we enable them to be involved as successful citizens in their community, regardless of their views on a particular political issue or the political party to which they may belong. It's a nonpartisan cause that I think is fundamental to the lifeblood of democracy. It's one that I think every business can benefit from thinking and learning more about. And then, of course, regardless of where one sits in the economy or the business community, we each have the opportunity to ask ourselves, where can we make a difference in working with people in governments, across civil society, and with each other to defend democracy? 
I think democracy is under more threats in many ways than it has been in quite a long time. And unfortunately, as we've said so often, technology is both a tool and a weapon. And we need to strengthen its use as a tool, as we are in Ukraine, and we need to protect against other people weaponizing it and using it against us. That's one of the reasons that I'm particularly excited that the Cybersecurity Tech Accord, a group that Microsoft helped found, a group that has more than 150 companies from almost 25 countries working together, including with a new announcement today. An announcement that is calling on us in a principled way to combat the weaponization of technology literally in the form of cyber mercenaries that are building and selling tools that others are using as weapons to attack the democracies of the world. More broadly, perhaps than anything else, I think we live in a time when we need to recognize that democracy itself is an invention that has bought, brought almost unimaginable benefits to the people of the world. And yet it will flourish only as long as we continue to lean in and do what it takes to protect it, to preserve it, to promote it. Technology is the most powerful tool we have to do all of that, but only if we think hard and use it well. That is what part, a big part, I think, of this summit is all about. Thank you. Thank you to Brad Smith for those remarks and for framing our discussion and to the team at Microsoft for all the work that you do in this space. We're now gonna to turn to our first topic of discussion, the response of companies to attacks on democracy and human rights. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has generated unprecedented attention on the role and influence of the private sector when democracy and human rights are under attack. Mass protests in Iran, democratic backsliding in Tunisia, the arrest of union activists in Cambodia, these situations and many others have required companies to assess how to leverage their presence and their influence to address attacks on civil society and attacks on democracy, including how to support democratic governance and civil society organizations, and how to prevent their own tools and resources from being misused. And our first panel is gonna to speak to the efforts their companies are undertaking in this area. I'm gonna invite them to join me on stage as I introduce them. Karan Bhatia is the Global Head of Government Affairs and Public Policy at Google, a role he has held since joining the company in 2018. In this role, he leads the company's engagement on a broad array of public policy issues and oversees its engagement with government officials and political stakeholders in the United States and more than 100 other countries. Alyssa Starzak is Vice President and Global Head of Public Policy at Cloudflare. Prior to joining Cloudflare, Alyssa had a prestigious career in the U.S. government in a variety of senior national security positions, including most recently as the General Counsel of the Department of the Army, as Deputy General Counsel of the Department of Defense, and Counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. Neil Potts is Vice President for Trust and Security at Meta, where he leads a team of subject matter experts that guides the company's strategy on issues related to safety, security, extremism, and human rights. And his career has spanned public affairs, policy, and legal landscapes with over two decades of corporate leadership and public service. And finally, our moderator, Paige Alexander, CEO of the Carter Center, an organization which needs no introduction. Paige joined the Carter Center as CEO in June 2020 after a long and distinguished de global development career with over two decades of experience spanning the government and nonprofit sectors, including as executive director of the European Cooperative for Rural Development and several senior leadership positions at USAID. Paige, let me turn it over to you to get started. Great, thanks Marty, and thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, I am fortunate to be joined by a panel that has a lot of private sector and public sector expertise. So I was thinking about all the work at department, at DOT and USTR and, and Commerce and others, and I thought I really feel like I'm back in Washington, able to use acronyms again and people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That does not happen in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so this is really SDG 17 at its core, trying to find ways that the public and private can, sectors can work together. Uh, I have had, at, at the Carter Center, I'll tell you, we've had 40 years of working in human rights and civil society uh, and democracy and governance. And when I had a conversation with President Carter, which we had numerous conversations during COVID, sitting in, 
his ranch and uh, ranch style home in Plains and trying to explain to him what a bot was or what doxing was or just having the basic conversation about why we've worked in 115 elections in 40 different countries, yet the digital threats that are posed to the elections now and to democracy are real. And we've had collaborations with each of you over time in the work that we've been doing, but it is still relatively new. So, you know, I want to talk more about concrete strategies that forward-thinking private sector leaders like yourself are making in this area and how your companies think about its role in democratic society. So, Kron, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, we, uh, Under Secretary Graves was talking about Russia and Ukraine in particular. So, what has the Russian invasion of Ukraine meant for your company in terms of your efforts to respect human rights and to get actively involved, and what are some of the responses that you oversaw during that time? First of all, Paige, thank you for the incredible work that you and the Carter Center do and the former president does uh, in advancing this entire area, really important work, and we're grateful for that, for that partnership. Um, look, I think Russia-Ukraine was a very, very important moment for the whole business community in terms of thinking about its engagement in, in this space. For, for Google, I will tell you, when the war began, um, it was an all-of-company, top-level down effort to work really on four fronts. Uh, I think the first was doing what Google does normally and does uh, hopefully well, which is getting information to people that need it. Uh, and in this case, it was particularly the people of Ukraine who were looking for basic information. What's going on? How do I find loved ones? How do I escape from where I, I might be? And this brought to, together a lot of our core products, so search, maps, um, YouTube. I mean, it was, it was uh, the first and primary instinct that we had was to create and bespoke tools as well for that situation to get people what they needed. The second was recognizing that this was going to be a new kind of challenge to, uh, to you know, coming up in this kind of conflict, and particularly one where disinformation, the threat of disinformation rose to the fore. And so we took steps very quickly, um, frankly, in advance of any kind of government compulsion to deal with that threat. And we did everything ranging from taking uh, off thousands of videos that we could see were clearly contained disinformation to, for us, the really unprecedented step of taking entire uh, publications, Russian state-owned publications, entirely off of our platforms globally. Um, unprecedented, but we felt important to defend really the the integrity of the of the system and to deal with the challenge that was that was at, at the forefront there one thing i would mention is what we did not do what, although we shut down our business in russia we stopped selling ads we made made no money there what we did do was maintain youtube going into russia because it was clear that they were other products were being were being shut down the only source of objective information they were getting was was through that Two other things very quickly I will mention. One is cybersecurity. The threat of cybersecurity was profound, uh, and we've, we've uh, been working with the Ukrainian government on how to protect their institutions, a uh, variety of, of tools and techniques there. But effectively what we've done is sort of folded the protection of Google's own services on top of a number of Ukrainian institutions. And then the last was work that we and many other companies have done to help the Ukrainian refugees, the sort of exodus of refugees that we've seen, including very talented uh, technologists uh, as well that move, have moved out into neighboring countries and the United States and elsewhere. So full company effort, a lot going on, but, it, but I think an important moment for all of us to think about sort of what our sets of responsibilities are in moments like that. Great, thanks Karen. So you mentioned cybersecurity. So Alyssa, let me ask you, because we have partnered together, Cloudflare has worked with the Carter Center on a lot of these cybersecurity issues, but you've also worked with civil society. So I'm curious as to your thoughts on this. 
Yeah, well, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna echo the praise for the Carter Center. Um, you've done amazing work, uh, and it's it's been an, it's been sort of not it's been an honored partner with you. So I uh, really appreciate that. Um, so I you know I, I I'm gonna start on the Ukraine piece I think because um, it's certainly I agree um, it, it was a galvanizing moment I think for um, for a lot of entities in the business community. Um, Cloudflare, you know, ultimately provides a bunch of cybersecurity protections. And so when, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, we really started to think about what we could do that was unique to us as a business. Uh, and I think we came to a couple of different very specific things. Um, so the provision of services. So looking at how we could protect uh, entities within Ukraine, um, both on the on the civil society side, but also on the government side, uh, from from cyber attacks. So what we saw early in the conflict was that um, the Russian government uh, deployed a bunch of basic DDoS attacks um, against critical infrastructure just to scare people. So things against banks, against media organizations, making them look like they were offline, making it look like it was much more powerful than uh, than it might have been. We have tools that can protect against that. It was really important for us to make sure that those were things that were easily available. So we actually have done a, a lot in that world. We saw the same thing on the civil society side. So as refugees started to leave Ukraine, um, what you saw was uh, were attacks, cybersecurity, just a variety of different kinds of attacks uh, designed to scare that population um, and to make it harder uh, as they were leaving. And so to the extent that we could help protect there, those are things that we did. Um, the other category I think that we've done is actually just the provision of information on what's happening on the network. So being able to talk about when networks get shut down. Um, so when you see internet outages, for example, um, or when one of the things we saw in Ukraine that was a sort of unusual and, and from a time of conflict standpoint, we see, saw re routing of networks. So when an occupied territory, uh, when, when, when a territory was occupied, the Russian uh, occupied for, occupying forces would take over the network, reroute the traffic through Russia, and, and deploy the, the sort of censorship controls that were happening in Russia for that population in Ukraine. So being able to report on that um, as, a, as, a, as a company that sort of provides networks around the world and can explain what's happening, we had a unique ability to really talk about what's happening on the ground. Um, and then the third set of things, I think this actually um, ties into some of what Google talked about as well, is making sure that we continue to provide tools that enable people to access information on the outside. And that's, that's entities in Russia too. So if, uh, if somebody in Russia wants to access news sources that are legitimate, they probably have to use a VPN. Um, they probably have to use those tools. And we wanted to make sure those remained available inside Russia. And we saw, um, you know, I think one of the things that's encouraging about times of conflict in some ways, you see people's desire for news. You see spikes in, um, in, uh, in people adopting VPNs. Um, and we can see that on our network. We have, we have a set of tools that are, that are like VPNs. So, so lots, lots to do in that space. So you have a lot of clarity on a number of those areas. <clears throat> Let me ask you, Neil, you know, protecting public debate during war and uh, protests is something that you all have worked on. Fair why don't you, yeah, a fair amount. So why don't you give us a sense of exactly what that's looked like and what you've seen and, and where there have been successes? Oh, the sure thing. And I will start off by echoing um, my colleague's response about the Carter Center and also thanking CSIS for the invitation to speak today. Um, Talking a bit about Russia Ukraine, but I think in many ways, the way that we think about this at Meta, that it's obviously broader than just one conflict. And going back to, I believe it's 2018, we started to look at what we now call active response countries. So countries that are going through some type of civil unrest, that may be conflict, maybe having a high, highly intense elections period. And how, which ways do we show up in those situations? And so we all have talked about things like access to information, the ability to communicate. And I, I kind of reflect back to, um, prior career, well before becoming a lawyer and working at great places like Meta, I was a US, United States Marine. And I carried a rifle and a radio in the Marine Corps for about six years. And the one thing that we had to focus on was mission. And what is the mission and what is your task for the day? And so for the mission for Meta is to allow people to build community and bring the world closer together. And so that includes all of these aspects, all these things that we think that we hold dear to core human rights, the right to freedom of expression, the right to political participation, the right to association, all these kind of concepts that come together at a head. And we try to build services through our human rights due diligence programs that oversee and have input into our products, our policies, our people, and how we show up into these situations. So giving people that right to access, ensuring that our services stay up in these points of conflict, making sure that they have abilities to have secure communication systems, whether that's through end-to-end -end encryption, being able to have features that will lock a person's profile when there's that threat of surveillance. We heard from Brad earlier. 
Um, all these things come to bear in these situations and making sure that we treat that with the necessary context of what's actually happening in these um, hyper-localized regions is um, something that's important for us. Yeah, that's, uh, that's incredibly interesting because I think the work of, Alyssa, and you touched on supporting civil society and the echo chambers that a lot of the, this discussion in the fog of war actually present. You know, can you give me a better sense of, actually I'll start with you, Alyssa, a better sense of a civil society uh, intervention that you feel that was made that really ch was a bit of a game changer? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that, so our, our project to help civil society is called Project Galileo, um, and it's actually interesting to go back to the origins, partic particularly now. Um, so what we saw, um, it started back in 2014 when we were a much smaller company um, before I started at, at, at Cloudflare. Um, but what happened was it was right at the time when, uh, when Russia invaded Crimea. Um, and so at the time, we were a small company. We still did protection from DDoS attacks. Um, one of the things that makes us kind of unusual is that we actually provide a free set of services. Um, and so at the time, it was, again, still a relatively small company. Um, and sometimes if you had a really big DDoS attack and somebody was using free services, they were like, okay, we can't support this, we can't support this. Um, and at the time, um, our CEO would look, at the, uh, would look at the specific entities that had been cut off the day before, and he looked at one in the same time frame and said, hey, that looks weird. And he looked at it, and it was a media organization in Ukraine um, at the time that was having a massive DDoS attack that sort of ended up affecting our network. And that, he looked at that and said, what is happening on the ground? Um, a journalism site was getting attacked in the time of an invasion. Um, and at that, that was the point where he said, no, 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 we can't do this. We have to make sure that those entities don't go offline. Um, and I, I think that we see that in journalism, we see that in civil society. We have to make sure that those are exactly the type of entities that are protected from attack. And because that's a role that we can play as a company, uh, that's a, an area that we want to be a part of. And so since then, we've engaged with uh, a variety of different kinds of civil society organizations, thinking about how we can deploy that set of services, how we can better protect organizations, how we can build partnerships that really protect civil society groups um, to make sure that those things don't happen and they don't get taken offline by something that they should never have gotten, that should never have been attacked in the first place, right? Um, and so being able to talk about that to protect them is a really important part of what we do. That's great. And Karana, how about you? I mean, the Google Suite, I, I know I've used it many places. Uh, when I was at IRX, I used it with Josh. We had, we've had these suites available for a long time. How are they different now? And what part of that is something that you touch on in the current phase with human rights defenders and other elements of society? Yeah, look, uh, we're super proud that we are able to support human rights defenders around the world in many different ways. So today, for instance, we are very proud to be announcing that we are creating a $2 million fund to help support human rights organizations around the world do a better job of resisting and, and protecting themselves from, from some of these kinds of online threats. But I think the biggest thing we can do is continue to innovate products that actually help them uh, you know, serve their mission, accomplish what they, what they need to do. And so you know, I'll, I would flag, not, I mean, obviously, you know, things like uh, the security that's built into our search products, the, the, the kinds of uh, bespoke things that we are doing on the cloud side to enable uh, uh, NGOs, journalists, and others to be able to uh, operate, f you know, ideally free of, of the kind of pressure and threats that we see them uh, engaging with. But I go back to some of the um, fundamental threats that we see to democracy deriving from the threat of disinformation, state-sponsored disinformation, which certainly has increased, we talked about in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war. And, um, you know, some innovative work that we have done through our Jigsaw unit, this is a subunit of, of, of Google, um, around what we call pre-bunking, right? So you've, you will have heard of debunking uh, a myth or, 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 or uh, a meme. This is getting ahead of the myth or meme, and it requires some really careful, thoughtful work around what is the nature of the, of the hate that is going to be spread or the, or the disinformation that is going to be spread and starting to seed 
you know, videos, for instance, in this case, that we would, we would put out on, on, on YouTube or other social media to sort of sensitize the community that we think is going to be targeted to watch for this kind of information. And we found it to be extremely helpful in doing that, and in so doing, making the democracies that are sometimes targeted more resilient. So, you know, uh, new ways of trying to get at these ever-evolving set of threats to human rights and to democracy. And I think that's where it really does require a partnership. It requires a partnership between the technology platforms, between the experts who understand what is the, what is the, the, the sources of vulnerability potentially in these, in these markets. So it's an example. It's a great example. I'm also going to ask for your forbearance. There's a QR code up there. I've been given an iPad. Never tried to do it this way before. I'm used to someone handing cards. So if you have questions and you can start filling them in, I can make sure that I can make sure that I get those questions to the panel. Um, so, so Neil, I, you know the online attacks can really undermine democracy, and we have worked with you all on the big lie, the big tech that our, our, uh, our the Carter Center put out a repeat offenders report. And so Meta has been very good at some of these, but how do you address the potential concerns that your tools can be misused? Karan talked a little bit about that, and we certainly saw it in, in DDS attacks and people uh, getting into the systems, but would love to hear from your perspective. No, no definitely, and I want to give uh, an applause to Karan and, and the work you're doing on human rights defenders. We have a similar program for human rights defenders, and there's a little bit of parallel consciousness going on right now. So, oh, two million, so if we can uh, maybe increase our, our spend a bit too, but um, all the work, and I think we see it across industry, these are really whole society problems. And to have cross industry responses, industry, private sector, public sector responses, working with civil society and human rights defenders to actually really make our products more resilient, to get them to the people um, in the most need is really important. I think your question, though, was how do we build some of that resiliency into our products? And so I guess I first start out with, um, you know, I, again, go back to what you know. So I kind of go back to our mission and think about what our product is doing today. So we have about 3.7 billion people across Meta's family of apps and services. That's, uh, you know, doing the math and for the folks that aren't connected and maybe minors uh, that aren't allowed to be on, on the platforms, that's a significant amount. You're probably over half of the world's eligible population at that point that are on Meta's um, family of apps and services. And those people live in about 170, or excuse me, they live in about 170 countries, speak dozens, of, dozens upon dozens of languages with all the various dialects. And then for us, it's how do we show up in an environment and Karan mentioned disinformation and misinformation, but also a big component for us is conscious basic content moderation. How do we show up in these places? Um, so fortunate, fortunate to have enough resources to bring thousands, tens of thousands of people um, to ensure that we have, that are committed to safety and security throughout our products. And we try to look at what I call the three Ps, people, policy, and products to actually make us more resilient. So we have experts that are, in our terms, cross-functional. So whether they're policy wonks, legal folks, they are product engineers, they are investigators looking for harmful activity, harmful content, harmful behavior on our platform in ways that we can root it out. We also look at making sure those products are very resilient. We could hire 3.7 billion other people to monitor those and they can trade cards at, at noon and, and come back on at midnight. That's not going to work, but making sure that we have automated systems that make us more resilient to the scaled, scaled attacks. And then these partnerships on the ground with, think, with people like trusted partners. So human rights defenders that can add cultural, local context so that we can make the correct decisions. So these are all ways that we can build into that level of resiliency um, across a number of issues. Um, Brad mentioned the, the tech accord. Um, that is one way that we're looking at security issues and making sure that we are stronger against these, whether we call them cyber mercenaries or surveillance for hire um, operations that are supported almost, you know, they're, they're capitalist in some way, and they, but they work for, for governments, authoritarian governments, to go out and surveil, um, surveil users, often human rights defenders, journalists, critics of the existing um, people in power. How do we make our platforms more resilient to that? You do that by a number of ways. You can remove accounts. You can uh, build in the uh, 
or stop the sharing of certain domains, but also notifying users that they are being surveilled and then working across and happy that Google is part and we'll make sure that Cloudflare is, has the opportunity to join as well. Um, part of those initiatives, and I think that's been echoed by the White House in a recent EO as well. So <clears throat> we talk about what's happening internationally a lot. Do you think there are lessons that can be learned both from the international context to what's been happening here in the U.S. or vice versa? I think, you know, as I mentioned, Carter Center has worked in 40 different countries on elections. <clears throat> Excuse me. It wasn't until 2020 that we had a conversation with President Carter and said, we need to look in our own backyard. We can't keep looking overseas. What are some of the lessons that you all, as your companies, have learned either overseas that are relevant here in the U.S. or vice versa? Um, Alyssa, I'll start with you. Sure. So, uh, so I started at Cloudflare in 2017, um, just after the 2016 election. Um, and I think it was uh, the 2016 election was a shock for a lot of reasons. And I don't think you'll hear different sort of voices about um, for a lot of us. Um, but the thing that was sort of striking for us as a company, again, think of us as a cybersecurity company in this context, was, was thinking about the infrastructure that applied to elections in the US. Um, it's very localized, right? So you have state, municipal, you know, municipal governments, um, counties, um, they all run elect election infrastructure. Um, and none of them were thinking about cyber attack at the time. And so we realized actually in 2017 um, that that was also a set of vulnerable entities that, that really deserved protection and needed it because they were the source of definitive truth. So um, what you see is um, election systems are about trust. Um, and uh, we have to have sort of trust in the underlying systems. I think, again, this will be a, th a theme that you hear echoed. Um, some of that is making sure that the entities that provide authoritative information are protected from attack. So we actually launched a project in 2017 um, to provide free services to state and local governments um, for a, a variety of different kinds of attacks. Uh, those have been uh, very successful. Uh, we've seen, uh, we've, we actually saw some attacks in this last election for entities that weren't protected. So um, we've been trying to be out there talking about the importance and the ease of, of getting, uh, getting cybersecurity services um, for those entities. Again, with the idea of at least protecting the authoritative sources of information, which are state and local governments in that context. Great. Kron? You know, I would maybe uh, broaden the open the aperture a little bit, broaden the view. I think one of the things that we've learned from being engaged in this space uh, globally that, that is also applicable here is just um, how many ways technology actually helps enable and support democracy. So um, at a very, very macro level, you know, you think about the importance of things like economic opportunity to maintaining robust democracies and the role that technology hopefully is playing in, in doing that, um, the empowerment of people. I mean, when you stop and think about historically how that disempowerment has happened, it has largely been driven over the course of you know, hundreds of years previously by disparities in access to information. And what technology today has enabled is this almost revolutionary, it is such an audacious thing to think that somebody who is a laborer, a farmer, might have the same access to information as the top level of government by virtue of simply having access to, to the internet, the, the broadband, the connectivity, which you know, to the point made, made earlier, I think is a fundamental challenge that we continue to need to address. But I think that role that technology plays is, uh, is fundamental, and it is as fundamental internationally as it is here in the United States, and it underscores the importance of enabling that access to information. And then beyond that, beyond that sort of fundamental economic contribution that, 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 that I think technology makes, it does have a very profound role, I think, in, in, a, few, in a few sort of discrete ways related to democratic processes, right? So, so maintaining a robust public square where information can be shared. And we have seen that being challenged globally increasingly by a variety of new regulations, content restrictions and things. And frankly, we've seen threats to that in the United States at the, at the state and local level, uh, even potential threats at the federal level. I think the necessity of an active and vibrant press, and I think that is, that is again, a place where 
the relationship between technology and, and the press is, is uh, I think, a symbiotic one. Free and fair elections we've talked about, but again, I think uh, technology and platforms can play an important, important role there. And then lastly, fundamentally, sort of respect for human rights. And I think, again, we've talked about ways in which technology enables that. But I think all of these lessons that we've learned around all four of these spaces globally are, have clear resonance in the United States that we're seeing increasingly play out in policy discussions here. Yeah, and it, uh, still along these lines, you know, we, we have seen what happens when people are not media literate. We have seen what happens when you enter an echo chamber and you're just convinced of the next great thing because you're only in that chamber. Uh, you were talking about an active and vibrant press. And so I'm curious from your perspective, what elements have you seen that are relevant overseas and domestically? And has it been on the area of, you know, we're talking about civil society and human rights, freedom of the press, I'm curious from your perspective. No, and I think, not to, to be too repetitive here, but that access to information is so important. And maybe just to uh, put a fine point, it's access to seemingly accurate information as well. And so in these environments where we are um, at risk of influence operations being run by other governments into a sovereign nation's election. Um, not pointing fingers. Um, but as we, as we look at those types of um, incidents, making sure that people, that the population, the citizens have accurate information or information that they can trust, or at least that they know that they should go out and verify. So we've taken a number of steps around misinformation, disinformation, these types of networks, these types of operators to make sure that we try to never have a pristine information environment, but try to clarify as much as possible and give people enough knowledge to know when they should investigate more. That's something I think that we, at least for me personally, that we have thought would happen overseas, but maybe not in the U.S. as much. And that has um, been, you know, really um, just, I guess, top of mind for me for a number of years. Secondly, interestingly enough, um, we have a number of policies that deal with misinformation and we call misinformation harm. So this idea that misinformation can lead to some type of imminent harm offline. So whether that's violence, some other type of harm to property. In those contexts, I've often thought when we were building these policies um, uh, for Meta, often thought that was something that was happening in developing countries and in other parts of the world. Um, let's fast forward to maybe, and we built these policies out uh, many years ago now, uh, but fast forward to 2020 when we saw kind of this summer of, of racial unrest um, in some ways and racial justice in the United States. And seeing some of the same activity that we did not focus on in the United States, perhaps since you go back to the civil rights um, movement in the 60s, but we did see in other parts of, of, of the world and being able to utilize those policies and adapt them appropriately for this environment was something that A, I'm both very proud of, but also goes to the point of how connected and how similar we are. And I look out in the crowd and I see some former colleagues that helped me write those policies and make sure that we could enforce them um, as well. Um, but that was something I'm very proud of, but it also gives us that understanding that we have to build for this global community and that there can be lessons learned and shared across borders. So building for the global community is an interesting concept. You know, it has always been known that democracy is good for business, uh, but how is business good for democracy? You know, I, you had talked about, um, well, uh, Karen, you talked about the concept that everyone is connected. There's so much interconnectivity. And I can tell you, when I, when I left USAID, I worked in Europe, uh, and one of, for, I ran an NGO that was linking farmers to markets. <clears throat> I was amazed at how they could leapfrog things that we never thought could be done because they had a cell phone. They had the ability to connect. Uh, I, we're, our main client was a beverage company based out of Amsterdam that puts beverages in green bottles, and they were very, they were very good about looking at the long-term effects of locally sourcing. But that could only be done because these farmers were connected at the end of the road. And so they could learn to grow what they could sell and not just sell what they were growing. So do you have individual experiences where you have actually seen how business is good for democracy, where you've actually made a change because of your products, because of the work you're doing, has actually had an effect on a democratic principle inside a country or inside a community. Um, I, I, will, I don't want to call on you first, no, but no, you're I'm, shaking your head, so I'm going to go. I, I just passionately agree yeah. with your proposition, Paige. I think it is so true. Um, 
So I have the opportunity to travel around the world. We, we, have, uh, we have teams in, in many places. And when I go, one of the things I always ask to do, if, if possible, is meet with small businesses there. Because we, um, you know, Google today is a very large business, but it was only 25 years ago that we ourselves were a very small business. And um, the, the passion that you see in these small businesses that are looking to um, better themselves, that are looking to become a little more connected, that are looking to access markets that they hadn't accessed before or enable their um, employees to be a little bit more effective or a little bit more connected, is it's just heartwarming to see that. And you realize that these um, businesses, by virtue of being connected through technology, are being exposed, obviously, to uh, new markets, new ideas, new production opportunities, but they are also being very much exposed to the ideas that they're picking up from around the world, right? Of how, do, how, how does one operate a business in a contemporary environment ethically? How do you, how do you operate consistent with best-in-class anti-corruption principles. I mean, there's just a lot that you gain that is part and parcel, I think, of an effectively functioning democracy. And so, yeah, I mean, I was just meeting with, um, I, was in, uh, I was in Southeast Asia, uh, I was in Thailand and met with a group of small business enterprises that were uh, exporting avocados, uh, interestingly, to markets uh, around the world. And this was a collective, this was a cooperative that had Farmers who basically went online, etc., but utilized that connectivity, utilized that to not just learn about their avocado markets around the world, but to look at the news and to look at what was going on and to understand how what was happening in their remote region actually tied into the rest of the world. And you could just see it opening up their awareness of political issues, uh, democracy issues, as well as you know, the near-term benefits to their business. So it's, it's inspiring to meet with, with people like that. That's great. Melissa? You know, I, I completely agree with that. I think, I think one thing that we sometimes forget when we, we get into conversations about how technology has, is you know, problematic for human rights or, um, and we forget the potential it brings. Um, it's, you know, if you think about, uh, if you think about 40 years ago, um, what it would have been like to be a small business during the pandemic, you almost certainly would have gone out of, out of business, right? And a lot of them did, even in the pandemic now, but the ability to be online, the ability to do things, to connect, to, uh, to serve uh, through an online mechanism, to go to school online, I mean, it, that's nuts. It's not something that, that, that would have happened or would have been able to happen. It, Maybe we would have adapted in other ways, but the reality is there's still potential from a business standpoint um, and from, a, from a, a personal interconnection standpoint that comes from being online. I think that, you know, I, th I think again, as we think about the challenges that come in, I think the next era for us is going to take that, being able to take that potential and understand some of the, 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 the challenges that come with it and build sort of processes that, that move forward in a, in a way that reflects the challenges and sort of takes consideration of them, but still recognizes the potential. You know, I, I, I worry sometimes when we talk about technology that we forget the sort of the hugeness, or the, or the, the, the sort of the, the, the massive, um, the, the, the massive opportunity that comes from me being able to be connected with anybody around the world in sort of the blink of an eye where you can turn on your video camera and all of a sudden have a conversation with someone, you know, 12 hours away in Japan or, uh, you know, a, a, anything like that. Um, it's just, there's so much that comes from that. Um, there's so much opportunity for global connection, for business, for, uh, for idea, uh, the, this, the, the spread of good ideas, right? The, the anti-corruption piece um, that, that I think that we have to, we, that's what we have to harness going forward. I, I completely agree and you've harnessed the positive nature of the connectivity. I realize there's a negative side to it too. And often they got that, small business. They got small <laughs> business in the negative side, but no. Okay. No, no, no. I, but I mean, there there is the positive side, and there there's the ability to address when things go wrong. And you've all touched on it, and I think y'all have done an excellent job at attempting to address that. But with the billions of people that are online, it's hard to do it. Interested in your your thoughts on both the positive and the negative aspects of where technology can play a role in 
democratizing. Oh, I, think, I think we did touch on a lot of this, and I, I am also very eager in, uh, for the opportunities. And so much of the work that I um, am fortunate to lead at Meta does focus on, I think people would automatically say, well, that's defensive work. How do we stop harmful actors, harmful behavior, um, illegal or harmful content from appearing on the platform, exploitation of our services for all these ills. Um, and that is, one, that is definitely one component. And so I mentioned earlier kind of the number of people that we have that focus on these tens of thousands, I think it's about 30,000 uh, people that focus on safety, security, and building in those systems to make us more resilient over time. But that does take a, again, I think the key operative word here is time. It takes time to build in those processes. It takes time to understand the context of how we have to operate. We do use machine learning, and that takes time to understand and to build and become smarter um, as well. In the specific context of elections, as we think about providing that access to information, I mentioned earlier kind of there's never a pristine information environment, but having authoritative sources that can be surfaced, it can be anything from knowing which poll that you're going to use, knowing who the candidates are, and having an ability to uh, utilize and, and read their platforms, but also not being corrupted by disinformation or false narratives. That is part of the work that, that, that goes into this. Also the support for our human rights defenders and journalists. So we do have specific policies that protect um, both of those groups from harassment online. We often see that, whether that is in thinking of places um, globally, uh, where that may have been a, an issue that we thought was going to reside outside of our borders, but maybe even inside of our borders where we see that type of harassment. So that can be the mass coordination of what we call in the, in the business troll brigades or groups of people looking to target, the, target individuals based off of their occupation, maybe based off of their protected characteristics. Uh, they can be targeted individuals, they can be vulnerable like children, making sure we protect those rights of the child as well. So all these things I do think um, lead into democracy. But then again, all the great opportunities, that economic impact, that's something that I am very um, eager about and that's why I really do love the products that Meta provides because that helps people build those communities that they can start the small businesses, they can connect, they can find their market, they can find that group of people that will then empower them to be more active in their local communities both through that economic opportunity, but then ultimately through uh, political participation. Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you. So either I am as much a Luddite as my 98 and a half year old boss, uh, or y'all are a very quiet group today and no one's asked questions. Uh, so unless there is a pressing, I don't, it, it's not popping up, so that might be me. Uh, uh, so, and we're just about at time. Let me do, let me do a lightning round. It's kind of unfair to you all because I didn't talk to you about this before, but if you were to wave a magic wand and make one policy change that would help the work that you do uh, help civil society and human rights groups be better, is there a policy change that's out there that you would like to see? Um, uh, ah. I, may start, I may start. I don't necessarily have a policy change. That's why I'm going to start and uh, <laughs> go first. Let these folks, much smarter than me, think about it. But one thing that I think we can really gain from democratic societies is their willingness to stand up and call out some of the bad behavior by the authoritarian um, governments across the world. Um, no need to name them here, but having a very defined approach from all of the democratic societies to when they see this behavior, to call it out, to stand up and support companies like Cloudflare, like Google, like Meta, as we try to connect people in these places to bring more democracy globally, I think is very, very important. So I don't know, it's not, I don't have a policy line to do no, it. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. Thanks, Neil. Uh, you know, I think I, I'm going to actually go some, something related. I think policy change is hard. But, I, you know, I think one thing that we, uh, that there is a, there's a role for governments um, in working with each other to think about what norms look like. Um, and I think that one thing that we haven't seen enough of, um, and I think this is the pace of technology and the pace of change, we haven't talked enough about sort of what are acceptable behaviors online? How do, we, how do different governments actually do the things they want to do under sort of a, 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 the appropriate human rights rubric? And I think, um, I think that's that same set of challenges. I think that if there were shared expectations between governments, I think we, uh, about you know, when is it okay to block a website, for example, just something basic, right? When, when is that censorship? When is that, um, when is that uh, something that's appropriate? When is is it acceptable to uh, to do a right to to attack um, a website, for example, uh, in the cybersecurity world? I, I think if we had more agreement in those areas, um, we would have a, a better, stronger path forward. Shared understanding, very good. Uh, 
I'm going to go with, I think, a, a, something close to Neil's, but I, I maybe even put a finer point on it. I mean, we, there is a, and this has increased over the past 10 years, freedom of speech online is increasingly at risk. Um, there are governments around the world today that uh, are it, clearly the authoritarian governments, but even democratic governments are less uh, rigorous and vigorous in their defense of freedom of speech online and indeed are in some cases advancing uh, policies that uh, you know, very much put that at risk. And uh, we were thrilled to see the declaration of uh, last year that adopted in, uh, at the end of 2021 because we felt it was such a firm statement by the United States, Europe, Japan, some of the leading uh, democracies of the world in defense of that. But that is only going to be effective if, you know, case after case it is called out and it is vigorously defended. And there really is not just uh, discussion but alignment among positions among the democracies to take that on. Um, because otherwise, I will tell you, the, the, the platform companies are themselves increasingly at risk for enabling that speech to continue, which we are committed to doing. But when your employees are being threatened on the ground around the world, when companies themselves are being threatened often with criminal penalties for enabling, for allowing that speech to happen, um, it, is, it, is, it is a precarious spot. So I think this discussion that is happening today at the summit here at this, at this conference is super important. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Please thank our esteemed panel. Appreciate all the work y'all do. And thank you. Marty, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. That's great. Thank you so much, Paige, uh, for that moderation, and Neil, and Alyssa, and Karan for a really insightful conversation. Um, we're going to keep on going straight into our next panel and our next discussion, uh, which is on advancing labor rights to build a stronger democracy. I'm consistently surprised how many people see economic inequality as the single biggest threat to democracy. This is what surveys consistently show. And so a conversation around labor rights and what happens inside the workplace is an incredibly important part of today's forum and, on any, and for any conversation about the role of business in democracy. So this panel is going to discuss how companies can support sustainable democracy by respecting the rights of workers and their operations and throughout their supply chains. I'm going to introduce our panelists and invite them to join me on stage as I do so, beginning with Thea Lee, uh, who is going to provide us some framing remarks to introduce the session. Thea is the Deputy Undersecretary for International Labor Affairs at the U.S. Department of Labor, where she leads, you can come up and sit down, where she leads U.S. government efforts to strengthen global labor standards, enforce labor commitments, promote equity and combat child labor, forced labor, and human trafficking. She's been an advocate for workers' rights, both domestically and internationally, for over 30 years, including most recently as president of the Economic Policy Institute and for more than 20 years at the AFL-CIO. Joining the panel following Thea's remarks are going to be Nate Herman, Senior Vice President for Policy at the American Apparel and Footwear Association, which represents more than 1,000 industry name brands. Nate oversees AAFA's policy department and manages the association's lobbying, policy, and regulatory affairs activities, as well as their corporate social responsibility program, formulating and implementing CSR policies, and representing AAFA in the industry on CSR issues. And Shauna Bader-Blau is executive director of the Solidarity Center, the largest U.S.-based international worker rights organization, partnering directly with workers and their unions, and a member of the National Endowment for Democracy family. Shauna has worked in this field of international development and human rights for 25 years and has lived or worked in more than 25 countries. And finally, our moderator, Kevin Cassidy, director of the International Labor Organization Office for the United States and Canada and representative to the Bretton Woods and Multilateral Organization. The ILO is the only tripartite UN agency that brings together governments, employers, and workers to set labor standards, develop policy, and devise programs promoting decent work for all. Kevin previously served as a communication, senior communications and economic and social affairs officer at the ILO 
Office for the United Nations, as well as with the ILO's global campaign on promoting fundamental rights at work. So first I'm going to welcome up Thea for some introductory remarks, and then we'll turn things over to Kevin for the panel. Thea, thank you. Thank you so much, Marty, and to CSIS for bringing us all together today, but also for the great work that you do all day, every day uh, in this space. It is wonderful to be here with all of you and with this stellar panel that you have to look forward to to talk about how advancing labor rights is critical to both defending and advancing democracy. We know that strong labor movements are essential for healthy, inclusive democracies. Independent, democratic trade unions provide workers a voice in the workplace, community, and the political system so they can defend their rights, advance their interests, improve wages and working conditions, and have a voice in the policies that affect their lives. Unions, employers, unions and employers can work together through collective bargaining to craft solutions that balance the needs of workers with those of business. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that countries where workers leverage collective bargaining to set wages and working conditions have less inequality. And Marnie was just talking about that. The contrary, sadly, is also true. Where unions are repressed through violence, intimidation, private sector action, weak laws, or weak and inconsistent enforcement of labor laws, there is both inequality and lack of democracy. There is a direct correlation between strong unions and poverty reduction, economic growth, and other key development goals. One reason is that freedom of association and collective bargaining uh, inherently build democratic muscle and culture among workers. And that is why authoritarian and undemocratic governments fear that above all else. When unions have a meaningful voice in policy development and regulation through tripartite mechanisms with unions, employers, and government at the table, whether at the workplace, in the industry, or at the national level, the economic, political, and social relations systems and institutions essential for democracy thrive. And this is the reason we need to strengthen the capacity of democratic worker organizations and take action to protect workers and unions and countries where worker rights and democratic values are under threat. And unfortunately, these threats happen all over the world, in rich and poor countries, in North and South, in East and West, including in the United States of America. Uh, the Summit for Democracy, which we're very proud to be part of today with this event and another one we'll have later at the Labor uh, Department, but from 2021, the Summit for Democracy recognized and underscored the connection between economic democracy and political democracy. And one expression of this is our recently launched Multilateral Partnership for Organizing Worker Empowerment and Rights, which we call MPOWER. It's a great acronym, and I didn't come up with it. Um, and the U.S. Labor Department co-chairs that, along with the International Trade Union Confederation. We're also proud to have the State Department, USAID, in the U.S. government as partners, and we've welcomed the governments of Canada, Germany, Spain, Argentina, and South Africa just in the last couple of months to be founding members of Empower. It brings together, Empower brings together governments, labor, philanthropy to promote an enabling environment for freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, to strengthen the capacity of democratic unions to organize, represent workers, and to facilitate the conditions for unions to be active participants in a vibrant civil society, including as a critical partner in social dialogue. And one of the things I've seen in this job, which I've been in for almost two years now, is that when there are tripartite mechanisms in a country like Honduras, where workers and unions, uh, unions and employers and government can sit in a room all together and hash through some of the issues, that creates uh, a space for dialogue that is incredibly valuable and that does change outcomes and it changes culture. And I think that was mentioned in the previous panel. Empower has delivered on its pledge to devote almost $130 million over the next couple of years to strengthen freedom of association and collective bargaining globally. Um, and we, we're very pleased about that. So today's meeting and the summit's call to action to the private sector are so important because of the private sector's critical role in this work. This includes your efforts as employers to invest in your workforce, as well as management and due diligence systems throughout the supply chains, taking a high road approach to business and ensuring the full spectrum of labor rights as defined by the ILO fundamental principles and rights at work. The rights to freedom of association, collective bargaining, and protections against child labor, forced labor, and discrimination. 
But in addition to modeling responsible behavior, the private sector must and can speak out against and stand with workers and trade union activists who are under threat for calling to account their governments or their employers. And we heard some of that in the previous uh, panel, very in interested to hear how the big companies like Meta and Google are engaging in this space. The private sector's voice and action to protect worker rights is actually in some ways more powerful than that of governments or civil society or unions because it is unexpected. Uh, so I, one of my messages today is that for the private sector, I want you to understand you should never underestimate the power of your voice. Uh, with respect to freedom of association and collective bargaining, uh, ensuring that there are adequate resources when in, in governments where one of the key issues is there's never enough resources for labor inspection and enforcement, but there never will be if uh, we keep uh, pressuring countries to cut taxes down to the bone so that they don't have the resources to devote to that. But it is something that's clearly in the interest of responsible businesses to have a consistent government enforcement of labor laws so that the good players are not undermined and undercut by the bad players. But we have come a long way since 2011, when the world agreed on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Since then, we've seen the regulatory landscape shift in line with the protect, respect, and remedy framework. So that is governments protect workers with strong laws and enforcement. Companies have a responsibility to promote and respect internationally recognized worker rights in their supply chains, and together we collaborate on remedy. And those standards are now moving past voluntary. We see that the European Union is developing strong mandatory due diligence systems to promote decent work throughout their global supply chains. The U.S. is taking a different, more outcome-based outcome approach through enforcing our prohibition on imports of goods that are made wholly or in part with forced labor and leveraging the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act and trade tools such as the rapid response mechanism of the USMCA that ensures respect for labor rights at the factory level. We're also seeing a growing number of companies engage in outcomes-focused supply chain agreements with their suppliers and workers. This includes the International Accord for Health and Safety that grew out of the horrific loss of over 1,000 workers' lives nearly 10 years ago in the Rana Plaza factory in Bangladesh. The accord has now expanded to Pakistan, and other companies have committed to similar and forcible agreements in the garment sector in Lesotho and India to eradicate gender-based violence and harassment at work. These are just a few examples of growing engagement with unions in the design and implementation of systems aimed at delivering on the protect, respect, and remedy framework. High road, binding approaches are at the center of our efforts to conceptualize what's next in the responsible business space. Freedom of association and collective bargaining deserve protection in their own right, but they are also enabling rights that are essential to building robust due diligence systems that deliver real outcomes for workers and other rights holders. We know that we actually can't get rid of forced labor and child labor if we don't also respect freedom of association and collective bargaining, because having unions at the workplace is an essential element to effective enforcement and implementation. And that helps us minimize also human trafficking, among other types of labor exploitation. But think about for a minute the difference between a union on the ground, in the factory or in the field, every day elected by the workers. This model in principle should be more effective than corporations spending millions of dollars and sending thousands of high paid monitors to parachute around the world, tentatively knocking on the factory door and being given only the access that is convenient. A union is there every single day. It is trusted. It is democratic. These are the pieces of the puzzle that I think create a new future global framework for private and public accountability for labor rights outcomes in the global economy. Governments, private sector, workers, and their communities are on the front lines to grow and connect our effort. This engagement democratizes the policymaking space, contributes to more effective outcomes, and represents a critical element of support to free and independent unions. Real, independent, democratic unions are challenging to both governments and business. But they're important precisely because they're difficult. And I ask you in the private sector to recognize that this is an inherent and a real contradiction and partner with us in this important work. Governments are acting, and I'm very proud to be part of the Biden-Harris administration with a worker-centered trade policy. This is extraordinary in my lifetime. As Marty said, I've been doing this work for 30 years, but I've never seen the level of commitment that we see from this particular administration. 
But at the end of the day, governments cannot succeed without the full-throated cooperation and enthusiasm of the private sector. We can regulate out the wazoo around transparency and other things to require more transparency, but at the end of the day, businesses will always have more information than we can even dream of. And business can, can drag its feet, and I, I know nobody in this room is in that category of businesses who would rather spend the money to hire lawyers and, um, and fight and fight and fight and fight unionization and fight uh, improved labor laws and minimum wage and health and safety at the workplace, or businesses can come to the table and be partners in building a robust and vibrant democracy around the world, using the power of trade and investment to make that happen. So I'm uh, delighted to be with all of you today. I, I'm sorry I can't stay for the full panel that's going to follow, but I know that you have here both allies and deep thinkers, and I'm very much looking forward to what they have to say. And uh, I wish you a tremendously fruitful and productive rest of the day. Thank you so much. So I take that as the cue to start. So uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be, uh, online or here in person. Uh, thanks very much to CSIS for convening this and to Marty personally for uh, inviting me to be here. Uh, our two speakers today, uh, I think they've been introduced, so we'll go right into it. And for me, it's a really a joy to be here because what we're seeing here is freedom of association and collective bargaining sort of in action. Um, workers need a voice. They have to have a democratically elected institution that is helping them. And also for businesses that they have associations and chambers of commerce that help them as well to navigate the, the world of work. So I'd like to start uh, riffing off a bit of what uh, Thea Lee was saying earlier about how respect for labor rights um, you know, provide resilient and strong democracy. So on the business side, you know, American businesses are overseas, you're very visible, you're very exposed on that. Um, can you give us examples about how businesses are supporting democracy and some specific case examples if you have some, Nate, please. Sure, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Yeah, there are a number of examples where the, where the business community, in our case, the apparel and footwear industry has been very active trying to promote labor rights, trying to promote civic space because of the importance of democracy for uh, our ability to do work and, and conduct business every day. And so one of those examples, uh, and that we've worked a lot with a lot of labor groups, a lot of NGOs, advocacy groups, is in Cambodia, where we spent a lot of time between the period of 2015 and 2020 trying to advocate for the promotion of labor rights. Uh, if anyone knows the situation in Cambodia, the, the civic space has shrunk dramatically in, in the country over the last five to 10 years, um, to the point where the labor unions and, and workers were essentially the only civic space left in the country. And so by trying to support labor rights, uh, supporting the, the right for unions to organize, trying to promote uh, or prevent the watering down of the Arbitration Council in Cambodia, we're actually in, in trying to support the remaining civic space that exists, trying to expand that civic space and then hopefully build the foundations to where Cambodia could eventually return to a more democratic country. Because we realize in that case, if, if the, the last piece of civic space, the, the labor movement disappears in Cambodia, then there's no rule of law in the country, and then our businesses are directly at risk in that country. Cambodia has become a very important sourcing destination for our industry. And, and we need to make sure that, that the rule of law exists and the only rule of law can exist is with democratic institutions and labor is the fundamental part of that. Labor also are, are our eyes and ears and what's happening on the ground and Thea talked about a lot about that is that we, we need that visibility on the ground that only labor can give. Um, that we don't have people on the ground 24 seven in every single factory, in every single location. So Cambodia is, is a good example. Obviously we have a long way to go in Cambodia. Um, they're still not going in the right direction there and so that's something that we're gonna be uh, continuing to work on and we are continuing to work on uh, today. 
Uh, another area where we've done a lot of work, and we've done this in part with the International Labor Organization, uh, as well as many others, is the, our work in Uzbekistan. Um, the, Uzbekistan, as a legacy of the former Soviet Union, uh, every fall for their cotton harvest, which is their main uh, product and their main export item, uh, they would basically mobilize uh, hundreds of thousands of people, empty out the hospitals, empty out the schools, empty out the government offices, and put them all in cotton fields. And over a 15-year period, it seems like forever, uh, starting back in 2007, we came together with labor groups, with NGOs, with the International Labor Organization, with governments, uh, to start the cotton campaign and to really lobby for the elimination of, of government orchestrated, government uh, imposed forced labor in Uzbekistan. Uh, and we were finally, over the last few years, finally successful in, in ending that. And the reason that's important, again, is that, as Thea mentioned, for, if, if you can't have labor rights if you have forced labor. You can't, have, you can't prevent forced labor unless there are labor rights. And so, the, in the case of Uzbekistan, by ending the systemic forced labor that existed in the country, we created the civic space that will now has started to lead, although it's very hit and miss right now, um, starting to lead to, to uh, the creation of freedom of association where workers are empowered and creating larger civic space for NGOs to operate, which then hopefully will lead to other reforms in, in the country. So there are, are ways to move forward. I'll, I'll stop there. There's other examples, but I'll stop there for the moment. And, and thanks for mentioning those examples. I mean, certainly we're involved in both. Um, what I'm hearing also is the political will is kind of the magic sauce on all of this. We're in Cambodia. It's been uh, a little bit weak, and in Uzbekistan, very strong to get to this point. I think Uzbekistan, we know that we need uh, investment there now, so now the boycott is over and the like. Um, so talking about Cambodia and now recognizing Chem Sitar is uh, under arrest. I don't know if she's been released as of yet. Um, you know, what are the vulnerabilities that workers are facing in these environments, and what more can companies do? And then more importantly, are you invited to the table to discuss these issues and offer solutions? Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks to CSIS and uh, to Nate and also to Kevin. And you'll forgive me, the beautiful trees are really like eating my allergies. I'm sure many of you have the same thing. So um, <laughs> forgive the, the strange voice sound. Um, so absolutely, there are three come to mind for me three fundamental ways that businesses can play a much more constructive role in the advancement and protection of democracy and democratic freedoms around the world um, than we have historically seen. And actually the two examples Nate just gave are emblematic of two primary, like really good ways. Um, you know, when we work as Solidarity Center with uh, workers across 70 countries every single year, the organizations they are a part of have 70 million members. So we're, um, you know, the lessons I want to share here have to do with um, conversations we've had with workers in agriculture, construction, factories, offices, domestic workers, all across the world over 25 years. It's a, um, three, three fundamental ways. So. First, in the workplace itself, you know, you think of your own lives, think of your work life. You're here now, but you go back to some other job or you had other jobs in your life, you think of your family, think of your own life. The, often the best part of your day, your waking hours are actually given to work. You're trying to contribute productively to something you're building. If those eight or 10 or 12, as the case may be, hours that you are spending every single day are um, a source of dignity, a feeling of pride and production. You, you leave feeling good and feeling like a contributor. But the reality for the vast majority of workers around the world, particularly in low-wage work, is the opposite. That those eight to 10 or 12 hours a day in the workplace are uh, actually lived in a um, conditions often of lawlessness, where fundamental laws that are supposed to be applied to your uh, benefit are not minimum wages, self, health and safety standards not applied, overtime not applied, your fundamental right to form unions and have collective bargaining completely skirted and very often not enforced laws by the government but also as practiced by your employer in the private sector. And so those eight hours are not a, are not a time of dignity, they're a, they're a time of repression and indignity uh, where sexism and racism as well are, are endemic. And so 
that's one sphere of, of life um, where if democracy is going to really deliver, the workplace is a fundamental place for democracy to really deliver for real people. And the private sector has a major role in making sure that those fundamental rights and laws are not undermined in the daily lives of workers, but in fact are uplifted. The, the second is at the community or national level. And the extent, extent to which private sector businesses and employers are actually interfering in the development of law and policy in countries to undermine and roll back uh, human rights that have been fought for and won by social movements and by labor movements um, versus uh, helping to uplift them. That's a fundamental way that uh, around the world, very tangible for the average worker, average working person, are businesses undermining laws that protect workers' rights or are they um, neutral or uplifting those laws at the national level? And then finally, the third on the global level. How is our global economy structured? We talked, Marty mentioned right in the beginning that inequality has a, is a huge drain on people's sense of whether or not democracy is delivering and whether or not they believe in democracy. Uh, when they see so much rampant uh, wealth and income inequality, which leads to political inequalities in countries as well. How is the global economy functioning and what is the role of the private sector and, and investors in advancing a global economy that is rules-based, that has norms that respect and protect fundamental uh, human rights? Um, and what I'm talking here about global trade arrangements, trade preference programs. I'm also talking here about um, the uh, importation of goods with forced labor. Are we allowing it or not? What is the role of business in helping develop laws and norms, not that undermine those fundamental human rights in the global economy, but uplift them? Those are three fundamental spheres, the workplace, the national level, and the global economy, where workers around the world can really benefit from feeling a stronger pro-democracy voice from the private sector. I'm going to uh, stay on this point just a few minutes. I mean, it's good to hear that you articulate that. You know, work has always been the nexus between the economic and the social. Very important for us. Um, and, of course, uh, if the governments are not providing for their uh, citizenry, they feel the government has failed them and then they're l looking for change. Um, in terms of your engagement with companies in the past, um, you know, this process of social dialogue, you know, the means of communicating, um, do you think that that's working or what, uh, what changes need to take place in order to have a really respectful social dialogue and something that is impactful on the uh, on those countries that you're working in well, look, fu fundamentally around the world there are of course many examples of times when workers and employers in the private sector are hammering it out negotiating it and fixing a problem and here I'm talking about not only formal employment but even the informal economy where that also takes place and those negotiations between workers and employers are fundamental to democracy. That, that I, I watched my, my, in my own family, I watched my own mother in the course of her career, a uh, working class woman, rural California, um, became a, a nurse, became a union activist, and uh, became a union uh, leader in, this is in Los Angeles in the 1980s. My own mother watching her transformation from shy and feeling a little bit like she doesn't have any voice or power to uh, getting to sit across the table from this mega employer, the biggest hospital in Southern California, and, uh, and, and negotiate over wages and working conditions. The power that my mother felt for the first time in her life in that negotiations has reverberated through my entire life. That transformation is really significant. And uh, when it applies across huge portions of society, uh, poor people, disenfranchised people, people whose societies say that you're lesser because of your race, because of your gender, because of your ethnicity, when you get that power in that moment and you undo those power dynamics that society is imposing otherwise on you, it's transformational. And that feeling moves outside of the workplace into community. Your ability to play a more powerful and vocal role in collective action in society is enhanced by that experience. So I want to say around the world where businesses and workers are coming together, fighting it out, angry, annoyed, don't like each other, whatever, still doing it, is fundamental to democracy, not only at work, but in societies and how people experience democracy. So it is the case that there are, there are these moments of real important transformational change. 
And I would also say the opposite is usually the case. The reality is for the vast majority of workers on Earth, that is not their experience. For the vast majority of working people, they are one occupational injury or disease away from absolute destitution because there is no social protection in the country in which they live and they have no health insurance provided by the state or by the employer. That they are one sexual harassment incident away from feeling as if they cannot go back to work and losing their livelihood uh, because of the uh, the insecurity of the situation, the uh, inability to address it. And so the reality is, it is in more cases than not, um, the, the role of the private sector is not filling the gap of government regulation and um, is not standing in uh, to advance and support the fundamental human rights of workers in more cases than not. We really do feel um, that the role of the private sector and the global and global business is in fact a missing voice in the fight for democracy and democratic freedoms and values around the world. And when they speak, as Nate mentioned, has happened in the case, cases like Uzbekistan and Cambodia, it makes a tremendous difference. Um, and we would call on you know, more private sector actors to take that step. You've raised an important point. We'll circle back in a moment to governance gaps and the like. Uh, so, Nate, on your side uh, with your members, and so how are they engaging with civil society or groups like the ILO that are in this space uh, globally? Um, are you finding that to be a good relationship? Are you building bridges? I mean, maybe the experiences from the business side on that. I think we're moving in the right direction. The, the issue that China highlights <clears throat> is that we're not doing consistently across the board. There are certain situations that the raise to a level where, uh, for example, I'm able to gauge my members to finally to act, to work together to, to address issues. And Cambodia was a clear example of that. Uzbekistan, we've, uh, coming out of COVID, as Shauna was talking about, there are a lot of situations where there was attacks on worker rights, which in many cases were attacks on democracy themselves, because when you, when you undermine worker rights, that's the first step towards undermining uh, democracy. And so we saw laws in in going in place in Indonesia, uh, in India and in Pakistan, trying to undercut wages, trying to undercut worker rights uh, that we try to, to, to fight against. The, but the issue is we're not doing it consistently uh, across the board. Um, one, that's just in part a bandwidth issue and just trying to have that management across the entire world. But But otherwise, it's just that they're, we're trying to run businesses every day. And so it's hard to get people to focus that, that these larger issues, while not impacting you today, will impact you tomorrow and trying to have that longer term view. Um, so in the areas where we have engaged, we have good relationships with the ILO, with governments, with, with the labor, with advocacy groups. Um, the issue is that we're not doing it across the board. And that's that's the that's an area where we need to improve. And Nate, I'll stick with you on this because we'll circle back to that governance issue. You know, we often hear that, you know, companies are there to do business, it's a transaction, um, but sometimes feel powerless in situations where you have weak jurisdictions or poor enforcement of those labor laws. Um, I mean, do you think that brands have a responsibility to sort of step in when we have those gaps and through the process of dialogue create a, um, a more appropriate response that we would want uh, to reflect the democratic values that we're projecting? Uh, so yes, but there are, there are limits to that. Uh, the industry, business community cannot be the world's policeman. Um, that there is a role for governments and governments can't abdicate their role in what they're supposed to be doing, in this case, protecting their workers, protecting their own people, protecting labor rights. But businesses do have a role to try and move things in the right direction or prevent things from going in the wrong direction. Um, and so that, that's, that's where the role that we really need to, to step in uh, more consistently than we do today. But yeah, that's, uh, that's where I would think that where the focus really should be is trying to get governments to do what they should be doing anyway. Uh, because we can't be everywhere, we can't do everything. Uh, in our case, the apparel and footwear industry in many countries is only one part of their economy. So our industry can't do it alone. Even if we try and get other industries, it's, we can't be everywhere and do everything. And so there is a role for governments, there's a role for international institutions, 
um, and there's a, a reason for everyone to work together to try and resolve issues. Um, I don't, I'm not asking business to take over the role of government, so uh, <laughs> the ILO does have a convening role of bringing those three partners, businesses and workers and, and countries together on that matter. I mean, Shona, maybe uh, focusing on that, you know, about, uh, you know, this idea of governance and so, I mean, uh, you know, there are examples like the Accord that we can point to and so, where there was a sort of an agreement that we needed to fix some things. Maybe you can speak a little bit about that and what is the 2.0 Accord or the 3.0 looking over the horizon? Um, well, first, I just want to say, start by saying, um, you know, we, we had a panel earlier, and there's, there'll be one later where we're talking about um, ma major companies with enormous wealth, power, and influence um, who are, in fact, driving the future of work, driving the development of technology that will govern what work looks like for all of us in this room and everyone around the world. And doing so without um, sort of taking on the democracy element of that. And so it feels really important to just put out there that when we're talking about the role of the private sector versus, you know, governments and governance, that it can be inverted as well. Um, and the reality is if we're talking about major tech companies, uh, a small number of them, a uh, small number of people making enormous amount of decisions about uh, when we're talking about the development of artificial intelligence and um, other forms of new technologies that will in fact lead to an entirely changed world for how we all live and experience work. Small number of people making decisions in a small number of cap capitals outside of, of and separate from government regulation. That's a serious question to look at in the future of democracy, not just the future of work. Um, what do those rules that are being set up look like and who's influencing them? Um, so I just want to park that. At the same time, of course, you know, human rights, the whole human rights apparatus, I mean, we have these aspirational, wonderful, and we love them, international institutions like the ILO. We're hugely invested in the ILO, uh, the whole international human rights system. But these are, these are largely non-binding aspirational goals we have. UN uh, Charter of Human Rights, Bill of Human Rights, etc. Uh, global business is very often governed in uh, ways that have uh, binding um, ar arbitratable um, realities. So in, in many ways, the human, human rights of individuals are governed at the national level. Like my right was violated, I got to deal with that in my local courts and they might suck or they might be good, but that's gonna, I'm going to sink or swim there. Uh, whereas business and international business in particular and the in and global investors have international, you know, bodies that govern their rights. It's a total mismatch. So in the reality, it, it does mean, of course, that democracy delivers at the level of countries and that we need great governance from governments and we need it responsive to citizens. But we also need to be attentive to the fact that there is a whole other realm of power uh, that is super governmental um, that is run by international, international business that affects all of our lives. So just two fast examples on a way that we try to bridge, workers have tried to bridge some of these, these gaps here. Um, one uh, has been mentioned a few times today. There's this um, agreement in a global supply chain context in, the in a tiny country of Lesotho, an amazing country with a wonderful history of labor movement, um, negotiated between unions, women's rights organizations, the local factory, you know, there, this is apparel, um, jeans, they make jeans, um, and three uh, U.S. global brands. All of them got together, negotiated an agreement together, and agreed to make this agreement not only apply in Lesotho in the local courts, but also in New York, <laughs> binding international arbitration to enforce what rights? The fundamental right to have unions and the fundamental right to have a workplace free of sexual harassment, sexual violence in that supply chain. It is possible to bridge the, this gap of international law and domestic regulation in the future of work in a way where workers have a seat at the table and it has been done in several cases mentioned today. It's few and far between, and it's far too rare. Uh, just for you out in the audience who are not familiar with the International Labor Organization, we're a 100-year-old institution coming out of the Treaty of Versailles. Our, uh, our function is really on a normative role 
but it is not the uh, bureaucrats of the ILO that negotiated. It is the representatives from the trade unions. Uh, it is the representatives of business, so it's not unusual to see Walmart or Disney or others at the table negotiating that. So it really is, you know, the actors of the real economy making those changes. Um, maybe in our last question here, just to both of you to throw it out, you know, there are a growing number of laws around the world that are, you know, focusing on due diligence, looking at business operations globally. There's Germany, the EU, there's the uh, withhold and release orders, and so labor provisions and trade agreements. This is constraining the, uh, the operating environment for bad actors. So, and Nate, in response to that, what is businesses doing to uh, meet those um, objectives? And what are the concerns that you may have on the business side and then to Shona? Sure. Uh, the, so these due diligence laws are, are asking you to go back all the way to the raw material in your product to determine any, uh, in the case of Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, if you have any nexus with Xinjiang and the horrible atrocities that are happening against Uyghurs, to, or the European due diligence proposal to make sure you have no nexus with human rights violations or environmental degradation uh, in any way. The, so this is a huge task for, for industry. Uh, for, to give an example, since we talk a lot about cotton in, around here now, um, so if you have a cotton apparel product, the cotton that's used in that product is five to six steps back in the supply chain. So you have the manufacturer of the jeans, uh, since Sean mentioned jeans, you have the manufacturer of the fabric, the manufacturer of the yarn that goes into the fabric, the, the cotton trader that sells the cotton to the yarn spinner, the cotton ginner who processes the raw cotton into a usable form that sells it to the cotton trader, and then you have the cotton farm. Um, and that, that cotton could have uh, transversed maybe 10 countries before it gets to the, the final place where the genes are, are made. Uh, in our industry, we are what is predominantly called a contract industry. So we don't even own the factory that makes the genes. We contract with that factory. So you're talking about we're a number of steps away from that. And so what we've been doing over the past five to ten years is trying to map that supply chain so that we can see where is the impact happening. Because we know that the impact is not always at the factory making the genes. It can be way up the supply chain back to the cotton farm. And so we've spent a lot of time trying to get visibility in that. It's not easy, it's not simple, it's not fast, but that that's, has been our goal um, because we know not only is it the way to comply with all these new laws coming into effect, but it's the right thing to do. If we want to be more sustainable, the, the issues where you have, uh, your, could have pollution of the environment, where people are dumping things in rivers, can be way up the supply chain. Uh, where bad chemicals are being introduced can be way up the supply chain. Where forced labor is can, can be way up the supply chain. And so in order to have a real impact, we know we have to have full visibility back all the way to the raw material. It's just not a, a simple process to get there. Um, and so that's, that's the issue that we're dealing with right now, is that these laws are sort of retrospective and we're trying to fix everything prospectively and trying to, to match the two. And, and this is actually really critical right now. Um, at this moment, 2023 in history, we're actually, in my 25 years of being active in um, global labor rights, uh, witnessing the most severe um, crackdown on the fundamental rights of workers in the history, you know, since I've been operating. We have entire labor movements who have been eliminated and crushed in countries like Belarus and Hong Kong. We have a military coup in Myanmar that destroyed all of democratic practice in the country. Um, uh, uh, and one of the biggest civil society institutions being the labor movement, and on and on. Um, Iswatini, Zimbabwe, there's a long list. We have more labor leaders in jail uh, in Iran right now and at any point of time in the history of the independent labor movement there. So there's a lot at stake, and the, the due diligence efforts that Nate is describing are absolutely critical to ensure that business is not playing and global investment is not playing a role in, in supporting these actions against fundamental human rights defenders in the labor rights sphere. The reality is workers in a country like Myanmar, all of whom labor leaders whose passports have been stripped, who are living under house arrest or in exile, 
will tell you we would rather zero foreign investment in our country than one more dollar from an international company going to prop up a military regime. That's workers in their own country talking about their own situation. And I listen to that because the reality is that in their view in the future of their democracy, uh, supporting a military junta in any way um, is more, it does more damage than good. Um, and the reality is a military regime does not support labor rights. Okay? It does not advance freedom of association. And the same can be true across so many supply chains. Um, if you're an international, um, if you're a company operating internationally, you're stuck with the democracy issues. You got no choice, they're there. And the reality is, um, what is the, the role when we think about the future of the work and future of democracy, what is the role of corporations? What is the role of business? Is it simply to generate a profit for shareholders? And if it is, then that's one answer we have. And I would say that takes us increasingly down a dark role, um, like hole into negativity <laughs> and uh, bad outcomes. Or is the role of business to make a contribution to our communities and our societies, which is actually the reality that people experience when they have good jobs? You know, when they have good jobs and good careers, that that um, private sector employer has made a positive contribution to their community, to their society, and their lives. What is the role of business? And that's the fundamental question when we're talking about the intersection of business and democracy. You know, Ms. Ruin, my last question in 40 seconds. In 40 seconds, just to say, uh, for trade unions, democracy means, and for business, democracy means. Your, what's your elevator pitch? What is your quote for today? Shauna. Um, for, for, for trade unions, democracy. For trade unions, democracy means equity at work, freedom in your society, and opportunity for all people, regardless of your background, at work, and in your country. Uh, for companies, democracy means that we have uh, rule of law, uh, full transparency and visibility to what's happening, full respect for workers, and full ability to make sure that we're working with the communities and the, and the, and the workers where we operate. Great. Shona, Nate, thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Kevin and Nate and Shauna. Fantastic discussion. We're going to take a short break, 15 minutes. Please have a, a coffee or tea or a snack, and please be back in your seats at 11 o'clock when we'll resume. Thank you.
guys ready? Okay. okay. All right, welcome back to the 2023 Forum on Business and Democracy. We're delighted to have our final panelists with us today. Our last panel touches on one of the most fundamental ways that the private sector influences democracy, strengthening democratic institutions by combating corruption. Corruption diminishes faith in institutions and it denies governments the resources needed to deliver services to their citizens. And the private sector, therefore, by necessity, plays a central role in efforts to deter and prevent corruption through promoting strong rule of law, transparency, and citizen engagement. And so I'm excited to have this final discussion with a group of experts um, who I'm going to introduce now and then turn over for a, mod a panel discussion. First, starting with Kathy Sheehan, Vice President and Associate General Counsel for Business Conduct and Ethics at Amazon, where she leads the team responsible for the design and implementation of Amazon's anti-corruption and business conduct and ethics programs. She's also the lead attorney advising the company on fraud and information security legal issues. Michelle Crimes is the Program Director for the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at the Center for International Private Enterprise, also a member of the National Endowment for Democracy family, where she works on a variety of global transparency and integrity initiatives, and in particular, the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center, which focuses on developing nimble, evidence-based anti-corruption programming for countries with new pro-reform leadership. And Megan Bridges, who is a manager for the Americas at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, where she supports the U.S. Columbia Business Council, the U.S. Cuba Business Council, and the Coalition for the Rule of Law in Global Markets. The coalition promotes and defends the rule of law in global markets as a critical factor in fostering a worldwide investment environment that supports equality, economic growth, and shared prosperity. And finally, our moderator, Richard Nephew, coordinator on global anti-corruption for the U.S. Department of State, where he is tasked with integrating and elevating the fight against corruption across all aspects of U.S. diplomacy and foreign assistance. Richard previously served as the Deputy Special Envoy for Iran, Principal Deputy Coordinator for Sanctions Policy, and Director for Iran on the National Security Council staff, as well as a Senior Research Scholar at Columbia University's Center on Global Energy Policy, and we're delighted that he's back in government in this incredibly important role at this important in time. So I'm going to turn it over to Richard to moderate our panel. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And, and let me start off by thanking everybody uh, for being here today. It, it's a pleasure to join you all. It's a pleasure to see uh, a number of familiar faces and, and, and friends around the room. Uh, I, I don't think I need to, to tell you, but I, uh, I think by obligation of my title, I'm required to underscore how corruption's bad. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it undermines the rule of law, increases costs for both businesses and consumers, and, and this is particularly important for the nature of this panel, it exposes businesses to both legal and reputational risk. So corruption is not just bad, it's bad for business, uh, which is something that both government and business recognize. Since the release of the U.S. strategy on countering corruption at the first summit for democracy, the Department of State has taken significant action to address vulnerabilities in the international financial system, hold corrupt actors accountable, strengthen multilateral anti-corruption architecture, and increase diplomatic engagement to support partners who are fighting against corruption. We've also taken proactive steps to engage with our private sector partners. For example, at the first Summit for Democracy, the State Department announced a presidential initiative for democratic renewal, the global initiative to galvanize the private sector as partners in uh, combating corruption, which blessedly was shortened to GPS in our <laughs> normal discourse and is being implemented by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and uh, Development. GPS recognizes the private sector has an important role to play in the fight against corruption, and it seeks to bring companies in as partners to share experiences with corruption challenges and co-create innovative solutions alongside government and civil society. And we're very pleased to announce today during the second summit that so far 18 companies have committed to joining GPS. There are too many to name them all here, uh, though some may be in our midst, uh, but we're excited to have you join us on GPS and look forward to future collaboration. We welcome companies' participation in GPS regardless of size, sector, and location, and we are happy to be in touch further about this initiative. But of course, there is much more that we can do to confront this challenge together. And the goal of this panel is to discuss ways that companies can go beyond legal compliance in their efforts to prevent and deter corruption. While there are certainly businesses with room to do more on this, many are already doing this, and we should recognize that. I look forward to hearing today with you more about what companies are doing already, the challenges they face, and what more we can do together. And so without further ado, let's turn to our panelists and over to Kathy with our first question. 
Why is ethical business conduct and collaboration with stakeholders on anti-corruption standards so important? Great question, Richard. Um, you stole my thunder with corruption is bad. That was going to be my answer. <laughs> um, uh, but first, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say how excited we are to work with you and your colleagues at State Department and at the OECD on GPS and other initiatives to collaborate with our peers, with others in the industry. Um, but why, why is corruption bad? It's bad for business, obviously. Um, but going beyond that, I will start with, you know, Amazon has a, a, a leadership principle. Our leadership principles really matter uh, at Amazon. And we have one that's called success and scale bring broad responsibility. And, uh, you know, the first sentence of it is my favorite one of all the leadership principles. It says, we started in a garage, but we're not we're not, we're not there anymore. Um, and so uh, the, the gist of the leadership principle is that we need to recognize that we have a broader responsibility to the communities in which we operate. And, you know, it ends with saying that leaders leave things better than they found them. And so when you think about corruption, it's, you know, we've, we've heard people say it shakes faith in democratic institutions, it shakes faith in government, uh, it interferes with economic growth opportunities, both for, frankly, for small governments and for, uh, for companies and communities uh, around the globe. Um, and so uh, it, I should say also more importantly, and perhaps most importantly, it, um, it impacts individuals and the poorest members of our society, um, it has a disproportionate impact on them. Uh, empirical data suggests that, uh, that it does have a disproportionate impact on the poorest members of our society because, frankly, they pay a larger portion of their income in bribes when required to do so. And they don't have the power to stop it. They don't have the authority. They don't, they don't have the ability to question authority. And so uh, companies like Amazon and other multinationals who have that uh, ability to challenge it must um, and I think in addition to complying with the law, as you suggest, obviously everybody needs to do that, but also we need to um, be, be vigilant about preventing corruption around the globe by refusing to engage in it ourselves and calling it out when we see it. Um, and, and, you know, at Amazon, we, we find that there is no business opportunity that's important enough to ignore corruption. In fact, we've walked away from very big opportunities uh, if we need to in order to do business uh, ethically uh, and legally. And we are unafraid to do so because we know how important that is. We, we are able to say that, you know, we, we are not going to, quote unquote, you know, pay a bribe or engage in this type, maybe it's, maybe it's a conflict of interest, maybe it's some other form of corruption, we're able to walk away and say, okay, if this is the only way to do business here, mm. we will do business elsewhere. Um, whereas obviously, um, you know, individuals don't have that same power. And so we think it's super important for these types of collaborations so that we can work with our peers uh, to continue to build out systems uh, throughout the globe uh, in order to prevent corruption uh, globally. I mean, I, and I think, you know, but the, the, the comment that I jotted down is the readiness to walk away, mm -hmm. right? And, and the readiness to kind of say, this is not an opportunity yeah. that, that's worth taking because of the risks and the complications mm -hmm. there. And so I want, I want to turn things over to Michelle a little bit, you know, to talk a little bit about, you know, SIP is, is not just anti-corruption, but anti-corruption is part of what SIP is. And, and so maybe give us a little bit of a sense of how the anti-corruption fight is, is part of your organization's efforts, any successes you have, and, and how you kind of get this message of not every deal is worth sacrificing. Uh, your credibility and integrity for? No, that's a really great question. So it's, I'm really uh, excited to be here. I'm great, glad to see some of the organizations we work with, like Solidarity Center, President uh, American Apparel and Footwear Association here today. Um, so what SIPE does primarily is we support democracy, and we do that through supporting economic growth, right? And um, we don't just do uh, anti-corruption. We have a whole host of programs. We do lots of things. Uh, and we do that by focusing on things like youth. How do we give youth uh, access? to uh, the, uh, markets? How do we empower women to uh, also be part of uh uh, democracy and then also part of economic growth. And so what we really sort of look at a little bit is um, using anti-corruption as a way to remove the ability of those individuals to be able to access economic power, to be able to have a job, to be able to uh, have you know security for your home, for your family. That's a big part of what we do. So anti-corruption is 
key and important there because if you're, uh, we focus primarily also on small and uh, medium enterprises, if you're someone really small and you can't afford to pay that bribe, well, or maybe you can, but it could be taking away from the prosperity or your ability to hire someone else in your community. It could be taking away from the ability for you to do other things and really take that, though, that um, investment that you've made into your community and actually doing well with it. Um, so that's why we really focus on that. We believe it's important. We really focus with small and mediums. We have the same conversation that, uh, you know, in particular, corruption is it's just, we, as we've already said, it's bad. We already know that. So it's, it's sort of the premise of where we are. We see a lot of success in terms of being able to have these conversations. Uh, we're able to work with small and individual, uh, medium, uh, apologies, <laughs> we're able to work with SMEs. I'm trying not to uh, use <laughs> alphabet soup in alphabet soup. It's bland. Go ahead. <laughs> it's good to do it. <laughs> So we, have, we see a lot of success there. Um, we've been able to work, for example, in places like Thailand. Uh, we're hoping, we've, we've had a lot of conversation a little bit about Cambodia, I've heard uh, as I was sitting here. We're hoping to work in those spaces uh, and really having these conversations and talking about the practical where the sort of rubber hits the road conversation of this is how you can do it and this is how you can sort of move that needle forward and create what I, I always refer to and I think a lot of people think about as a community of, um, of entrepreneurs, of small and medium businesses that are committed to being uh, ethical and sort of working above board. And that's really where we focus and where we think there's lots of room and opportunity for uh, discussions about uh, anti-corruption. Well, that's great. I mean, Meg. I mean, obviously, the American Chamber also, you know, has got a, a lot of work with with um, you know companies to think through the best way of approaching you know business uh, you know conduct ethically. You know, again, you're, you're approaching this in a slightly different direction than SIP, and so you know, maybe any reactions or thoughts you have about the kinds of work you're doing with companies to help both educate, inform, support them as they're doing this sort of work. No, thank you so much for that um, question, Richard, and. Uh, I'll start by saying at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a real core mission of ours is to, um, of course, promote trade and investment. And so, in so doing, uh, we uh, advocate and work with companies, uh, governments, and civil society to find solutions to um, enhance the rule of law because we really see rule of law as being a key priority for trade and investment globally. Um, I sit on our Americas team and we've done a um, research year after year with uh, business leaders throughout the Americas region and time and again rule of law comes out is the biggest um, opportunity and challenge for businesses in the region and so um, you know we elevate the rule of law in all of our conversations um, in all of our programming both domestically and globally we see it as that much of a priority um, and so in 2010, for instance, we um, founded the Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets, which I co-lead. And um, that is a, a tool that we use to engage with uh, across society to co-create um, solutions. And so um, that's just one example, but we also um, engage in, uh, with multilateral organizations um, in uh, for a uh, a great example is just last year we had uh, the opportunity in partnership with State Department to co-host the CEO Summit of the Americas mm -hmm. um, and we couldn't let that opportunity pass by to not leverage and elevate rule of law um, as a key objective in conversations with business leaders and heads of state from the Americas region. And so, um, you know, one such example is during the, uh, the two days of the summit we convened a panel discussion with um, the heads of state of the Alliance for Development and Democracy uh, governments. At the time, it was the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Panama, it's since expanded to Ecuador, um, to hold a conversation around how democracy, how they see democracy as being really core to their trade policy and their policy for FDI attraction. And so, um, since the, the summit, we've been continued to work uh, with State Department, with the Alliance countries and others in the region to continue to really um, drive the point home that uh, there is a very, very strong linkage between rule of law and trade and investment. You need to both hand in hand together and uh, we continue to, to drive that message forward. 
Yeah, and I'll say this is something too. I've, I've um, you know, found when I've, I've done some of my travels actually is the, is the direct linkage that's uh, between the business climate, and investment opportunities, as well as, uh, you know, what, what, what the, the domestic rule of law scenario is. Because you know, ultimately, if you're a business, you want to know that you've got some predictability. You want to know that you've got some ability to plan ahead. You have to understand what the environment is, and then you have to understand that you've got some, some degree of protection. And, and I think you know, this is where there's a, a, a harmony that potentially exists between you know the private sector to some extent in civil society and it's interesting most of the time you know there there is a little bit of stovepiping that goes on where civil society is in one spot and then the business sector is another and then government's kind of over here too I think one of the tasks that we're taking on in my office is to try and break that down. I certainly think that the Biden administration is also trying to do that too. So, and, and, and here I'd be very interested in Megan, Michelle, both, both of you, you know, your thoughts on, on how you can engage civil society, how you can bring civil society uh, in, how you can partner with them and, and make some of those connections with the private sector. Because as, as one civil society person said to me yesterday at a different meeting, you know, we actually are on the same side. We don't always feel like we're on the same side and sometimes we've got different motivations for for being on the same side, but come on, there, there's still an opportunity there. Um, so I think one of the interesting things that we've found is that um, we try to be led by civil society and sort of mm. by our partners on the ground. Um, I think if uh, sort of other uh, private sector actors start to engage with civil society, you'll find out that they're, they're very innovative and like you've said, we were on the same side. I think there might be sometimes differences over sort of how to have conversations, but there are these really interesting spots where you agree 100% and you can take those places and sort of grow from there. So um, I find what we, what we do a lot is we turn to our partners in country and we say, help us as we have, we have an approach, this is what we think is good, but let's talk about what's actually happening here. How do we adapt that? How do we think, and maybe we find out, you know what, this is not the best idea for here. Maybe we need to remove this part of it. We'll, we'll adjust our approach. We'll talk about it a little bit differently. And we try to put our actual, our civil society and our partners front and center and a lot of the work that we do. I think that um, in theory, if we do our work really well, uh, an organization like Sightbright should be able to um, eventually, I, I don't want to say not exist, but we should be able to turn that over mm. to the folks who are in country and then everything is sort of working uh, with those really wonderful professionals who you meet and who develop all those projects. So we really find that it's the best way to, to work is to let them sort of lead us and to sort of listen to their needs and bring our approach and then collaborate together really well. I wonder um, maybe what your experience is, what you, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, so through the Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets, um, as I mentioned in my last response, we work very closely with civil society and of course our business stakeholders and governments. And one of the ways that we do that is drawing upon the rich expertise and research from um, our civil society partners. So uh, a, a signature product of the Rule of Law Coalition is our Rule of Law Dashboard Report. It's been published since 2013. Where getting ready to actually launch it again in July of this year. It expanded from only 10 markets in the Americas to 120 uh, as of this year globally. So it just really speaks to the uh, real importance that our stakeholders are, stakeholders are placing on this tool. And so um, essentially the dashboard, it's a, it's a meta measure drawing from seven internationally recognized research indices and surveys. And we look to partners like the World Justice Project and Transparency International pooling from their research to really understand sort of how countries are measuring up with regards to rule of law, but for business. Um, and so we are looking at five factors in particular, transparency, accountability, stability, predictability, and due process. We think when those are strong, business is strong abroad. And so um, the tool is just so important. It's an empirical tool. It helps drive data. Um, it's a data-driven tool, excuse me. And, um, we find that it's very helpful in having conversations with, um, again, government, civil society, and business partners uh, to think through sort of where are the gaps and opportunities for the rule of law in specific markets. Mm -hmm. Countries have the opportunity to see sort of a snapshot of how they're measuring up to the rule of law and those five factors um, in the, you know, the addition of the dashboard. But um, as this is a product that we've been publishing every two years. Um, countries also have the opportunity to look at how they've um, ranked across time and also how they measure up in comparison to other markets um, and also against an OECD benchmark, which we believe that the OECD countries serve as a, a very good benchmark for other countries to kind of gauge where they're at um, due to the formal and informal commitments that OECD countries make to the rule of law. So it's a, 
It's a terrific um, um, tool and we deploy it in partnership with civil society partners across markets. We've taken it on the road um, to Ukraine prior to, the, prior to the war. We took it to uh, you know, Argentina, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, so many markets to really have those conversations with business leaders, um, civil society leaders and government leaders um, to have you know, critical conversations around how to remedy the rule of law in their markets. Well, it, it, what's interesting, I mean, you, you may have gotten the same reaction before too, but um, you know, I've found it, I can almost use it as a benchmark when I go to countries, whether or not they're paying attention to some of these benchmarks and these data pieces. So there are some places I've been where the, the predominant you know, complaint is, why aren't we higher on this list? Or why aren't we you know, in, in better stead on this data? The more interesting conversations are where countries are saying, how can you help me get to? How can you enable me to? What are the solutions that we can work on? And I, I think it's an indicator that there are some places where there's at least you know, some commitment to the concept um, that there's, there's interest in trying to, to, to work there. But I think you know, the places where you're not, where you're seeing people who are just trying to check the box, where you're seeing people you know, try and, and just uh, you know, deal with the, 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 what the needful is and, and try and avoid you know, making tough decisions, those are, those are different places to operate in. And so, you know, Kathy, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued. I want to pull back on this, this thought that you put you know, on the table earlier about there are places where we're not going to do business, you know, we're, we're going to make those tough decisions. You know, g give us a little bit of sense of kind of, that's, that's a tough set of decisions, though, that you have to make, and, and maybe a little bit on the thought process. And then related, and this is where I'm going to shift us a little bit to thinking about the challenges. Um, and, and I'm going to come back to, to everybody. You know, if you want to tail off with, tell us about the challenges you face and yeah. what are the regulatory and, and technological and other barriers, and then you know, maybe a little bit of what we can do to address them. Please. Yeah, um, I guess I'd start with, uh, saying that there's, it's, it's, not, um, it's not an accident that Transparency International is called Transparency International, right? Um, transparency is a huge piece of uh, dealing with corruption around the globe. And so, you know, if you think about where corruption resides is usually when there is a place where somebody has power over a resource that other people need. Mm -hmm. So think about that in, mm -hmm. in the civil context or the, um, you know, uh, you, you might be talking about a, a big deal that somebody wants and, you know, maybe five other companies want it and the, the person who holds the, 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 the key to that deal um, holds the power. But in the public sector, you're talking about, we may, you know, if you want to bring in, um, you want to you build a building in a, mm -hmm. in a country, right? Um, there are many, many, many permits and licenses required to build and occupy a building in many countries. In fact, there are some countries where the number of permits required, there are, these, are, these may be lower, so don't quote me on the number, but it, it can be upwards of like 4,000 permits mm -hmm. required to actually complete a large building and occupy it. And that's 4,000 contacts with somebody who has, you know, the permit or the license that you need to to move to the next step. And when you're trying to, to, to grow your business um, and you're trying to, to, trying to build quickly, um, that's power. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the ways we have to get ahead of that is to predict when you're going to run into those types of arrangements and who is going to interact with the people who hold that power mm. and make sure that you've done all the things. And, you know, and I can list all the things that you know, the DOJ says re are required for a good compliance mm. uh, uh, program and, and those are again not an accident you know you need to educate people you need to have policies that they know about you need to train them um, you need to have detection protocol in place and all of those things right but even when you have all of those things there are things that we don't control mm. and that's where these types of collaborations come in because you know we we walk into a region and maybe we do have all of these procedures and, and we do, right? But you then have to figure out like, well, okay, what does that license cost? Mm. So how can, how can I and my, and my team determine whether we're paying more than we're supposed to be paying for a license mm. if we don't know how much the license costs? And in most, I shouldn't say most countries, in many countries, um, there are schedules posted on websites that tell you what a license costs. Great, that's easy, right? They might even tell you what an expedited license costs, which is great because you're allowed to pay extra for an expedited license. But there are many places, particularly um, in, you know, um, 
developing countries or in smaller regions in developed countries where they don't have those schedules available. Mm, so mm, how do mm, I know mm. what a license costs? And that's a critical part of the program is to know what you're supposed to be paying so to know if you're overpaying, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, we're talking about things like collaborating uh, with you and mm -hmm. with you know our peers and with you guys to figure out like how do we help build that infrastructure up mm -hmm. so that everybody has those schedules available. Mm -hmm. And so those are the types of things we think about because those are the challenges we face. You get out there and it's like you're on the ground and somebody's trying to move quickly. Um, so there's other things, you know, there's things that we control as well, of mm -hmm. course. There's, you know, trying to predict and get ahead of problems like that. So like getting creative about how to address it. So, you know, an example of something that we've done in the past is, you know, if you have, um, a big deal, let's say, let's say you're working with a general contractor on getting a building up and running. You know, if, if you have an act of God clause, they're called in, in legal parlance, about um, you know, what happens if there's a big storm that prevents the contractor for, from delivering on time, why can't we have a similar clause that says if you know, access to government licenses are prohibiting your ability to move forward, you know, here's the steps you take and you're, you're allowed to meet, you know, you're allowed to miss your deadline. You have to be careful about that, obviously, because mm. people can take advantage of it. But why not predict that that could happen mm. so that your, your vendor or your third party, your contractor, doesn't think that the best and easiest and smartest thing to do is to just pay the bribe and move on, right? So you want to make sure that they're educated on what we care about and give them a better alternative to just paying the bribe and move on. It's not a perfect solution, obviously, for a lot of reasons I won't bore you with, but it's something that we think about um, and trying to be creative about at mm. the front end, because the idea is prepare for these things so that when they happen, there's something there as a backstop, because, you know, like I think somebody said at the beginning of this whole thing, you know, this type of behavior is going to happen around the globe, mm. um, and, it, and you don't want to be taken by surprise by it. So that's the type of thing, you know, that we think about um, and try to prepare for, and any company can do that. Um, but there's things that we can't do alone. And I, and I look at the transparency and the infrastructure. Um, also just trying to um, you know, make sure that anti-corruption standards are there around mm. the globe, mm. which they're, and they aren't everywhere, and that, they're, that when they exist, they're actually enforced. Mm. Like I can't tell you how many anti-corruption laws around the globe aren't necessarily enforced or are enforced in a very you know, haphazard type of way. And so that's where this type of collaboration, I think, can help as well. Yeah, so. The accountability challenge is something that, that I spend a lot of time thinking yeah. about in the enforcement piece yeah. of this too. Yeah. But you know, of course, you know that that all has to work in the confines of of an environment where where people see the benefits that come from that too. So Absolutely. maybe talk a little bit in, and I'll turn to Megan. You know, t tell us a little bit more about you know from your community what you're hearing about the challenges and the the both technological you know uh, business challenges, any other challenges that you see in, in in working on this issue. No, absolutely. Thank you. And um, going back to the dashboard report. Um, so no country performs at 100% on our on the indicators. Um, no countries score above the OECD benchmark. So there's tons of opportunities um, to improve, to really frame conversations in a constructive way with governments. And um, you know, at the chamber, we have multiple uh, mechanisms and opportunities to to bring business solutions to the table. Um, not just through our Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets, but we also have an Association of American Chambers of Commerce in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and beyond that, we have a very extensive network of AmCham's globally. Um, I, I counted 117 uh, last I checked, so we have quite an extensive network. And so, uh, you know, we are very, um, we have a big uh, opportunity to, to co-create solutions in partnership with um, governments and business. And so one solution that, um, that I've seen in my work with the coalition and also with our association of uh, American Chambers of Commerce in Latin America and the Caribbean is the real promise that we're seeing in the use of um, digital tools for government um, services and government procedures, kind of building off what Kathy was talking about in terms of um, concerns around licensing and permitting. Um, there is a huge uh, corruption risk there, as well as um, other areas like uh, customs, public procurement, um, and, um, and, and the such. And so um, we see opportunities to apply digital tools to bring transparency to the front of those uh, processes um, and really not just bring efficiency, reduce backlogs, but to uh, really curb corruption. Um, so that's just one example of a, a solution that 
uh, we are big fans of and continue to push forward. I think on a more sort of um, a global uh, kind of scale, um, of course, we're a trade association, and so free trade agreements are, uh, it's, it's, you know, top of mind for us at the chamber. We're very encouraged by the inclusion of anti-corruption provisions in some of the state-of-the-art uh, trade agreements um, coming mm -hmm. to the fore. The USMCA comes to mind, but also the trade protocol agreements with Brazil and, and Ecuador. Um, they all include uh, provisions on good regulatory practices, anti-corruption, and we really think that's also um, just uh, really a, a great opportunity to show the bilateral commitment countries have towards anti-corruption um, and to provide investors with the confidence to make strategic investment and business decisions in markets. Oh, thanks, M Michelle. You know, same, same question to you. What are the, what are the challenges and how, how can we address them? So I think one of the challenges that we often see, especially with uh, sort of who our partner organizations are, um, small and mediums again, um, how do I do this alone? We're too, <laughs> we're too small or, or how, how do we do it? So what we find to be a really wonderful and great solution is collective action, right? Sort of um, having conversations across a private sector community uh, for, of small and mediums, helping them to mentor each other, helping them to sort of learn about if you don't have a compliance, if you know, you're a mom and pop shop, how is that different than what maybe Amazon might do, right? But if you want to work with Amazon, you've got to figure it out, right? Like it, it, that's how it works. And so we found this to be really successful type of programming. Um, we've had the most success in Thailand where we were really actually able to sort of have a significant shift in culture where sort of, you know, there's the idea of sort of gift giving and things like this, um, which can be a form of corruption, which can happen in places like Thailand and many other places. Uh, but bringing the community together to say, hmm, maybe this isn't the best practice for us. Maybe this is uh, deterring from our ability um, to, you know, be a successful uh, private sector. Uh, and not doing it alone because you don't want to be the only one who's not doing it and sort of bringing folks together and understanding and working together. So that sort of collective action we've seen be very successful in Thailand. We've seen it be very successful uh, in parts of Eastern Europe. And I think it's a really uh, great way to bring together uh, the private sector through their different business associations to also learn about more about anti-corruption. Maybe you've got folks who just don't know what it is at all, right? You can start to bring folks in the fold. Uh, so it sort of is dual prong. You know, there's the challenge of we don't want to do it alone, and but what if other people don't do it? So you can say, well, do it together and, and sort of bring other people along with you. So um, I think that's a, it's a really great way, and we've seen tons of success along those lines. Oh, well, thank you for that. I mean, so I, I, I re realized at one point that I forgot to uh, draw attention to the fact you can submit questions through the massive QR code that is hanging <laughs> uh, above our heads. But fortunately, I didn't, I didn't have to because uh, we've already gotten some questions. And, and seeing as we're, we're running a little short, let, let me um, uh, ask two of them and take your, take your pick. So um, the, the first question actually speaks to something, Michelle, I think you said earlier about the importance of youth and engagement with youth and, and so forth. And so the question is, you know, what roles can businesses play in helping reinforce democracy by teaching the fundamentals of democracy to people all ages? Essentially a question about civics, right? And so the, the question is, you know, is, is there a way through all the various different programs and activities, both that SIPE does, that the Chamber does, that even individual companies do to try and reinforce these ideas uh, and, and these, these principles? Not just democratic principles, but, but you know, here the, the concept of, of anti-corruption. And then the second question, again, pick and choose as you go, um, is how do you deal with the paradox of how you, you deal with policymakers uh, in countries around the world that may, uh, may themselves be corrupt? And, and I'll, I'll take this one on the chin a little bit uh, uh, before uh, turning it over to, to colleagues here. We get asked this question all the time. You know, if we've imposed sanctions on somebody who is a serving member of government, do you talk to them? Do you engage with them? You know, we're a government. We have to engage. With, with some of these folks. But I think that the purpose of accountability tools, the purpose of, of helping to demonstrate that we've got a problem or concern with an individual or an entity or, or, or an institution is to be able to say, but, but we think that the, 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 the government's in question, we think the people in question, we think the companies in question should do something about this. Because part of the issue about accountability is putting a spotlight on these kinds of bad activities. And frankly, providing support to companies around the world that are trying to deal with these sorts of challenges too. So I think, candidly, some of this, this starts with, with governments. It starts with our ability to help provide support and, and, and engagement here. But, but that doesn't necessarily help when you're on the front lines dealing with these challenges. So maybe we'll roll this way and we'll start with Michelle. Again, take your pick of, of either of those challenges and we'll, we'll come this way. So I was thinking more about um 
you know, how do you essentially hit all sorts of different uh, aspects of any community, any society, and how do you bring people in? Um, I think some of my colleagues do a really wonderful, wonderful job at this, and sort of my work focuses on a bit more supporting them. But one of the things that I've seen them do really quite amazingly is exactly what I've talked about a little bit earlier, um, sort of getting the local context, understanding who those actual who the community is, who needs help. Like, so what youth community in Country X needs the actual help, right? I think um, my colleagues uh, do a really great job at figuring out who those communities are, how to support them, how to um, do things that are innovative, right? So I think I heard someone say earlier about like just the use of cell phone technology, uh, using technology in ways that are really innovative and really different than sort of what I might think of as someone who's, you know, former compliance. It's, it's a really interesting way to sort of approach programming. Again, being local, getting that context. I think um, that's the really one of the most important things that anyone, at least uh, an organization that's positioned in the way that uh, SIPE is, that's I think where we find our most innovative uh, programming happens and where we have lots of success, unexpected success sometimes as well. Thank you. Well, um, tackling that, that first question, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is the world's largest business association, which means we have um, not just a responsibility, but also an opportunity to um, support democratic norms, to um, enhance the rule of law, combat corruption. Um, and so um, we actually, um, you know, your question on civics reminded me of, uh, of an example on our Chamber Foundation side. They just launched last year an initiative called the Civic Trust. Um, and so um, the aim is working in concert with local and state chambers of commerce as well as businesses to really leverage business as a force for good in communities and to support aims of civic education, trust building um, in schools, workplaces, and in communities. And this is just so important, um, just to really underscore this, uh, in a study done last year by Edelman, they found that in um, an environment where trust is declining in institutions across the board, businesses are the most trusted institution in America today. And so we really have, again, a responsibility to leverage that, to work with communities to build that trust. Um, and so, um, you know, within the Civic Trust, uh, they, their inaugural program is the National Civics Bee. So they work with American youth um, to do exactly what I mentioned, you know, building civic education, knowledge, skills, um, and also work towards building trust um, in all, all institutions, including our government. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I'm going to address youth as a very broad, <laughs> broad spectrum. Um, you know, we, we actually have a pretty... Um, uh, um, big pro bono program in the Amazon legal department. And one of my favorite things that we do every year is Constitution Day, where we go into the schools, uh, both uh, middle school level, elementary school, high schools, to teach um, about the legal system and how it works. And we, and we do that in the United States, but we also have similar programs in other countries where we teach um, students how the, how the Constitution works, what, if it applies to them, how you know, their local legal system works. Yeah. And so we think about it from that perspective. But when I think about compliance, I think about it in a deeper way. Like One of the biggest assets I have at my company in my favor when I'm trying to deal with compliance issues is that I have a leadership team that is deeply committed to ethical business dealings. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's not, I don't, that is not always the case in many companies. I sh and so I know how lucky I am. But one of the things that struck me uh, not too long ago was that I, until I started doing this work, I didn't really know what compliance was other than like that basic check the box view of what it means. And the reason, you know, I went to business school and I went to law school and I didn't know what compliance was. Um, and so I think what we really need to start seeing is, is uh, compliance education mm. in the business schools and in the legal, uh, in law schools. And we are starting to see that. That's the good news. I know a lot of schools have programs addressing, um, you know, compliance, anti-corruption work, et cetera. And I think um, until that becomes kind of a norm and maybe, you know, maybe it's, maybe it'll never become as important as contracts, you know, <laughs> and, and, and constitutional law, but it, it maybe shouldn't be an elective that people only take third year, maybe, especially for business schools. Maybe it should be part of uh, the regular curriculum so that people are educated on this before they get to their corporate compliance department who then, you know, needs to educate them. And so, and I, you know, I, I don't want to ignore the other question completely because everybody else, kind of, you know, I think we're all trying to dodge it slightly because it's a hard <laughs> question. Um, but I think that's one way to, 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 to address that as well. It, it, you, you, 
it is very difficult, obviously, um, as a business who is doing business in a country. You can't, you can't pick and choose who you, get, who you have to work with um, in the government. We don't get to ignore that. However, um, you, you can, what, you, what you do is you refuse to engage in the corrupt behavior itself. And if it shows up at all, you walk away, you walk around, and you call it out so that that person gets called out to their um, leadership as well. Um, that's, I think, the best way to address it. No, I, 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 lo I love that way of, of ending, because actually that's the point that I wanted to take it from, too, is, and again, th this is where there is responsibility for government. Again, the part of the, the purpose of this discussion was to talk not only about the private sector, but also to bring in government's mm -hmm. you know, discussion on this. And, and this is one of the responsibilities that the United States government has, that other governments have, to help the private sector, to help civil society and others by holding actors accountable, by calling them out. And so I, I would just add to, to what you just said, when, when you identify that there is bad activity that's going on, you don't engage in it. But also, and I'll say this more generally to everyone who's watching, anyone who, who might hear these words eventually, but also tell people, T tell us. Um, tell us in the embassies, tell us here in Washington. You know, give us an opportunity to, to help respond to it. And the same thing goes with, with other government uh, partners. Well, I, I, I think we've, we've run through all the time that we had a lot, of, and I'm a stickler for trying to end on time. Uh, and, and otherwise, they, they told me they'll zap me through the microphone. So, so, <laughs> so I, I just want to uh, thank very much uh, our panelists uh, for joining me up today. I think we heard a lot of really interesting things. Um, I think you know we, we heard a lot about youth engagement. We heard a lot about civics engagement. Uh, certainly, the, the, the words I'm going to take back are, are readiness to walk away. Uh, those, those are quite important ones. But the key thing is to try and find if we can create an environment where that's not required, where that's not necessary. And I think that's part of the reason why we're trying to find ways of creating a business environment, both obviously here in the United States, but internationally, that doesn't require companies to have to make those type of, of tough decisions. Um, so uh, if uh, uh, the rest of you enjoy this as much as me, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. And thank you for your time. Thanks, thank you so much, Richard, and fantastic discussion. Megan, Michelle, Kathy, uh, thank you so much for being with us. I'll let you exit the stage while I, I uh, bring up our final speaker. Uh, we've come nearly to the end of our day. It's hard to believe. Um, but we do have one final speaker who I'm really excited to hear from uh, because he has been intimately involved in designing not just this event, but the entire week worth of summit events. So to close us out, I'm really delighted to introduce Johnny Walsh um, to share his conclusions and, and thoughts about this forum and the week. Johnny currently serves as the coordinator for the Summit for Democracy on the National Security Council staff. When he is not planning the summit and all of these side events, he serves as the deputy assistant administrator at USAID, where he oversees the Center for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. He previously, previously served in government in a range of roles, including at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations and elsewhere. Um, so we're really delighted that he was able to make the time today amidst many, many important uh, high-level events to give us his thoughts about this important topic. So, Johnny, over to you. Thank you all so much. Uh, I've been budgeted for half an hour on the schedule here but recognizing the time, I intend to at least double that. Uh, <laughs> um, in fact, you're catching me on a good day. The day before the summit starts, it's, a, it's an interesting time to have the, the role that I'm currently in, so I will try and get you to lunch. Um, enormous thanks, first of all, to CSIS, to all the organizations that contributed to where we are now, to the companies that made commitments, I mean, to the incredible Marty, who spearheaded so much of this process. Um, looking across the entire summit, virtually the only events that we formally endorsed as the US government as official parts of the summit were like held within departments and agencies. And at least until the very end, the solitary exception was the Center for Strategic and International Studies hosting this. And it, it really is a sign of our just immense respect and confidence in this institution. Uh, Georgetown snuck in at the end too, so we, we like them all right. Um, so in as much as I am, um, uh, the summit lead at the White House based on g grievous crimes in a past life. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how the summit came to be what it is and what we hope to get out of this at the, at the dawn of these few days and then come around to the role of, I think, the work that's happened here and that this event has helped really just amazingly shake loose. So from our perspective, the summit is really good for two things. It's number one, shaking loose specific actions that can strengthen democracy. That's a huge 
that that's a, it covers a huge range of ground, but specific things that we can do to strengthen democracy, counter authoritarianism, fight corruption, defend human rights. And second is to galvanize all of us to do it together. All of us, the democratic actors of the world who actually believe in democracy at a time when it's so often under attack. And so it's very important to us in hosting an event like this that the US show leadership, but it's even more important that we not be in it, that we all be in it together, that we not pretend that this is just about what the, what the US is going to do, or certainly not holding ourselves up as the arbiters of how to do democracy right. We approach it with humility, and we approach it with the sense that collective action is the only way we're going to meaningfully strengthen democracy, human rights around the world, or push back against authoritarianism in the many, many places it's crept in. And so, how, are we, how do we intend to do that? Like, what, what is the summit supposed to do toward those two ends? Certainly, we're trying to strengthen democracy itself, and you can see that in that, whether that means working on election integrity or strengthening civil society or putting guardrails on the use of technology, um, strengthening rule of law and court systems. But beyond that, it's at least as important for us to collectively show that democracy is delivering, first of all, material benefits, tangible benefits, and second, the more in intangible, like a sense of justice in a society, a sense that the system of government is uplifting human dignity. And democracy, I think, on both the material and the non-material, wildly outperforms other systems of government, despite the often prevalent narrative that authoritarianism is efficient or is effective. Um, and uh, third, beyond strengthening democracy, making it more effective, is showing democracies tackling the world's problems, the defining problems of our time. And I think you'll hear a lot about that from the president and from others as the summit commences in earnest. That means showing that democracies are doing the real heavy lifting in combating pandemics, dealing with climate change, addressing the food security crisis, addressing traditional security crises like that in Ukraine. That is more than a <laughs> security crisis, of course. Um, and so with those, with those objectives in mind, we gathered 15 months ago at the first summit. It was over 100 countries, and all of them brought specific commitments to the table, every head of state. Now, we're not naive. Some of them took those commitments incredibly seriously. For some of them, maybe less so. That was all right. It was a starting point. It launched a lot of processes around the world. Um, the US, we held ourselves, I think, to the highest standard of all as the conveners of this event. We announced the Presidential Initiative for Democratic Renewal, which is just an enormous expansion of our democracy assistance work around the world. I see people in this room who've been central architects of the thing. It not only expanded what we do, it updated it to the really pressing challenges of the 2020s, like the digital authoritarianism phenomenon, like corruption as it exists in the, in the modern era. Um, we launched a series of multi-stakeholder groups called Democracy Cohorts, whereby governments and civil society organizations would work together on a particular part of this sprawling idea of strengthening democracy, whether it was strengthening lady, labor rights or media freedom or fighting corruption or the role of youth, the role of women in a democracy. There were 15 of them all told. And they all came back with specific, sometimes, sometimes like, uh, realistic but tangible achievements to report back by this second summit. And now we come back together. A lot of work has been done in those 15 months. As we set out to plan this second summit, we had a few things that we really needed to achieve if this was going to be worth its salt. First is that we had to show progress, that all that work had actually achieved something. I feel extremely gratified at how that has gone since the first summit. Um, second, it has to not be seen as a purely American exercise. I don't think we viewed it as America, I know we did not view it as America, you know, teaching democracy to the world, or certainly democracy as an American value at any point in this process. But as it's evolved, it was so important that this become all of the participants doing it because we want to, and because we want to do it together, not because of 
diplomatic whatever from the United States. And so you see that in my favorite part of the second summit, which is that there's five co-hosts. Like this summit is launching in five capitals, basically one on every continent each one focused on different parts of democracy and human rights, and together kind of creating a really global celebration of democracy. And there's been so much creativity and energy surrounding those events in South Korea, Costa Rica, Zambia, and the Netherlands alongside Washington. Um, third is we had to include more stakeholders. And I think that it's not that there was no private sector role the first time, but we collectively wished that we had done more to engage the private sector in this inherently multi-stakeholder, everyone's in it together effort that we launched the first time around. And so, a few months ago, the State Department issued the call to the private sector to advance democracy. And that invited any company that believes in these values, that sees why democracy is good for businesses and businesses are good for democracy, to come to the table with their own commitments. There was no leverage applied, like just voluntarily, out of, out of the importance of these issues. State, I think, wisely grouped them into four areas of particular focus, which, was advancing tech, which were advancing technology for democracy, defending civic space, very closely related, defending labor rights and fighting corruption. And that's not an exclusive list. There are many different ways to support democracy. Um, but I think those particular areas dovetailed really well with work that the US was doing on, on technology. You're going to hear a huge range of deliverables on, from the president and others this week about how we're countering the hostile use of surveillance technology countering other forms of digital repression, pushing for a more open internet. Um, on labor, you'll hear discussion of a, of a national labor strategy, which we've been working on at the White House. On anti-corruption, you'll hear a huge suite of programs. The South Korean event is entirely focused on anti-corruption. Um, Treasury is doing one right as we speak. So there's a lot of work going on. And with the private sector helping us, I think it is all more than the sum of its parts. And that's why this is so useful. So it's the beginning of a process, not the end. I really stress that. But we got to work over those months. I'm so grateful to the organizations that convened roundtables to help bring these commitments together, the Global Network Initiative, um, Business and Social Responsibility, the American Apparel and Footwear Association, CSIS, as if it didn't already have enough to do to get this thing going, ran one of the roundtables, um, the State Department and USAID, ran their own anti-corruption effort, and companies showed up. Um, they came with commitments. We came out with a new fund to support human rights defenders, with things like uh, security keys to protect their digital security, with a form of like wh um, white glove service from another company for human rights defenders who are encountering attempts to compromise their digital security. Um, a range of commitments to provide data on internet shutdowns so that researchers can keep up with the latest and greatest authoritarian tactics to, to deny populations the use of the internet. Um, reporting on other campaigns by authoritarian governments to go after activists, journalists, and others. Sometimes active steps to impede the use of platforms um, to do so. We saw the state USAID initiative um, uh, GPS for galvanizing the private sector. Large range of companies signed up to help, help anti-corruption efforts abroad. For example, big companies here helping small companies abroad fight corruption as it, or resist corruption as it exists in their local context. Um, we saw the USAID Grand Challenge. We had a company promise a, a program of mentorship to the winners. A Grand Challenge is um, essentially a contest that has a history of shaking forth really creative, innovative ideas for how we can address a development, a major development problem of which corruption is one. And then I would just cite, in addition to things that came directly out of this commitments process, we saw lots of other parts of the Summit for Democracy that companies helped out with, partnered on. I would especially cite the media sector, um, in which at the first summit, President Biden announced a sort of st uh, seed donation to the International Fund for Public Interest Media. It was $20 million to start this neutral, 
multi-donor fund that could support independent media outlets, small and large, around the world. Companies joined in on that. Um, we saw uh, the private sector help out the Media Viability Accelerator, which is a USAID program that goes beyond providing grants to companies, but to help them become more viable from a business perspective. Another called Reporter Shield functions kind of like an insurance company to help small media outlets fight off predatory lawsuits whose purpose is just to drive them out of business. But with quote unquote coverage, they can either deter or fight off these suits in the first place. These are all really useful. Um, we, we don't have to agree on everything that the private sector is doing or that government's doing. There are many issues above all of our heads that this or that company, this or that government has not gotten to yet. But the world is better for the steps that we've seen that came out of this process. And certainly we have to implement them in earnest. Um, we have to build on them as time goes on because anti-democratic forces will not stop with the status quo. We have, to keep, we have to keep setting our own standards higher on how much we rally to support democracy at a time when it could be in great danger. But it's in all of our interest to do so. I would repeat that democracy is good for businesses and businesses are good for democracy. So to conclude, we'll, we'll be turning to many questions about the future of the Summit for Democracy after this week. You'll hear a bit of an announcement about where this is going. The process is most definitely not ending. But <laughs> with a little bit of time and space away from party planning, we will uh, turn really in earnest to questions like, processes like this one, like the democracy cohorts, how do we sustain them? Because these are intended to be a start, not a beginning for every stakeholder, every company, every non-governmental organization that is signed on to this effort. Um, I, I think though that all of it together has shown the summit, summit at its best. This, this private sector, this business forum has shown it. It has helped rally us to strengthen democracy and it has helped motivate us to get specific things done. I said before, we hold ourselves, the U.S. government, to a really high standard on that, and we thank others who have gotten on board as well. We're in this together. It's the only way that democracy is going to advance in the coming years. So thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for the commitments. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Johnny, so much for laying that all out. And what a fantastic summary of not just the summit itself, but what came out of this private sector process, which has been, as he said, a multi-month effort to engage companies on the Summit for Democracy and their commitments around democratic resilience. Um, I've been incredibly uh, impressed and inspired by the conversations that we had today, and particularly the, the wide range of tools and ideas that the private sector and allies came forward with on how to address human rights and democracy. Everything from digital tools, both offensive digital tools and defensive digital tools, um, different policies companies have adopted to make sure that their principles align with their practice, financial commitments that are being made, and then just a wide-ranging discussion about stakeholder engagement and influencing and the, the repeated importance of that came from every panel about engaging with stakeholders, whether they're civil society, media and journalists, uh, your own employees, workers down supply chains, uh, NGOs and human rights advocates, and of course governments, both the U.S. government and foreign governments around the world. Um, and so it's been just amazing to hear this uh, collection of ideas come forth from this process, as well as the specific commitments, Johnny outlined many of them, that companies have stepped forward with to, um, to make as a, in the context of the summit itself. Um, I want to thank again our sponsors for today's events, Ford Foundation and Open Society Foundations for allowing us to come together and have these important conversations. And I'll just end where I began this morning, which is just to say that I continue to believe that any efforts to address democratic backsliding, to make democracy more resilient, require all stakeholders to be engaged, including the private sector. As we've said many times today, business, democracy is good for business, and business must in turn be good for democracy. So thank you all for being here today, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.